started. And there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 297. With me is Ms. Adele Gutman. I never actually, my full name is a Gutman. Gutman, no? you know what? I mean, in Europe, where my parents are from, uh, sure, everybody said Gutman, but and I think sometimes my parents even do so, but uh, no, my brother and I just say Gutman. My <laughs> brother's a gastroenterologist, and he's Dr. Gutman. I love that. That works good. <laughs> that works good. It's like it's like having a dentist called Mr. Teeth. It's like, you know what? That kind Pretty of, much? it kind of is a calling. <laughs> <laughs> where, now, where is he located? Where, where is your where is your brother located? He he's he's a traveler. You know, he, we we were all living in New York, uh, but uh, my brother moved to Atlanta, actually Alpharetta, in January, and I moved to South Carolina, and my parents moved to North Carolina. So we've we've all moved very recently, within a year of each other, to to this area to be a little bit a little bit closer together, drivable nice. distance. A, a family closeness is far enough to make it an effort, close enough to be convenient, but not too close to make it too convenient. <laughs> you know what? The interesting thing is, you know, he's really uh, today's age kind of doctor because he just moved to Atlanta and not here because he wanted to be near a very major airport and he travels for his job. So he might go to Idaho or he might go to um, uh, uh, Minneapolis or Minnesota or something. He may go to a, a hospital in a place where they need more doctors of his kind. And, and then he'll work half the time, you know, two weeks a month and, and be at home two weeks a month, which is pretty amazing situation. He can work on his book. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Books are good. Well, I get. Is it about his profession or is it about something different? Yeah, profession. Oh, because yeah. Okay. Uh, whoa. Oh, wow. That was a visual shock, Robert. That was <laughs> a visual shock. You popped into my screen, but really in a big way. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I Adele like does it. I like good. to make a grand entrance. What yeah, you know, <laughs> Adele, Adele's easy on the eye. You, mm. <laughs> I just was making a point that my brother is one of those business travelers that never stopped traveling due to COVID. Oh. And yeah, and and staying at hotels and uh, and and enjoying the facilities. You know, he says that there are two hotels that he stays at all the time. One treats them like he's king. The red carpet. Oh, Dr. Gutman, you're back. You're the our most important customer. And the other one doesn't know he doesn't know his name. Yeah. Mm. Uh, by the way, Robert, um, I've decided to start a new company called Caption. I mean, no, 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 wait, that's been taken. Uh, I'm going to take one. Um, quote. There. <laughs> you know, my, my husband once said to me, Adele, I think a good name for a company you should make is Pillow. And I said, guess what? It's taken. Everything yeah, exactly. is taken. Uh, I'm always amazed uh, when a company like Hyatt would pick a name like caption that's a real word now because there's so much out there already and it just seems like it's easier to just make up a name by combining elements. Oh, they, they probably <laughs> trademarked it. I haven't looked deeply into it. I bet they trademarked caption by Hyatt. Yeah, ah. that, that makes sense. They, I do, I would imagine there is intelligence in the world for them that they would be making sure they box it buy all the variations and domains, all the typical stuff that you should do when you're about to announce that something somebody else can duplicate if they're not careful. So so, yeah. so am I on an island being puzzled by the decision and execution? I mean, Hyatt's normally pretty good on it, but I just looked and went, hmm, I don't know. Maybe I'm not the target demographic. I don't know, but <sighs> they no, just get maybe added. Like, maybe like W, which was a mystery to us all when it first began. Oh, but W? Then, yeah? Oh, it wasn't a mystery so. to me. Oh, it was no. a knock. W was a knockoff of Morgan's. Just purely. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. That was their attempt. A larger scale. They wanted it bigger so they had more rooms. And they looked at they looked at Morgan's and said, yeah, let's kind of have a 
yeah, the cool kids club with oh, kind of the velvet the rope. Name. I just meant oh, 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 why they did it W. Yeah, the W oh. I didn't get, but there's so oh. much that they could do. With that was it. that was off of the West. It was off of Weston, I believe. Yeah, but yeah, they but still... wow and wonderful. I, I, yeah. it just strikes yeah. me. You know, first off, this is going to get put onto our pile of. Uh, un undiscernible brand names and undiscernible brand guidelines. Like we had that little game roulette that you produced, Robert, which is still <laughs> stuck on my head of name the brand that we've never been able to successfully do <laughs> when you read the mission profile. Nobody ever gets them. Well, everyone, so I shouldn't say never. People have gotten and say, like, oh, good. Hey, that was good. And some yeah, of them are very, random, some of them are random. legitimately pretty good. Like I think Courtyards is pretty direct. And you go, yeah, that sounds like a courtyard. Right. But, yeah. But it, yeah. And then Residence Inn, I think, was kind of close to also something. But then again, it was also right. confused with a couple other long term stay. Well, yeah. Help. But then you get Staybridge and yeah, you get yeah. Town Place and you start going, oh, wait. Yeah. It gets <laughs> so, really fuzzy. Yeah. But with that in mind, hey, Melissa's joining us. Super. Um, the. You you normally your newsletters are like here's my personal opinion because hey it's your newsletter go for it, but this was like here's my personal opinion today. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what did I go too far? No, no, Robert. <laughs> there is no too far with Robert Cole. I'm just no. saying there is no yet horizon line that is too far for Robert Cole. It's just I'm reading it going, wow, there's a big axe on the grinder today. <laughs> No, I just well, I thought I was complimentary. I mean, I thought I provided some some oh, nuance here. with you know Ziva and you Zolara, did. which was genius. And again, I've been involved in so many of these, right? With some really top top ad agencies, right? I, I mean, I did a, a bunch of work with Shyatt Day, who are the guys who you know really came up with app. You know, the whole Apple campaign is a hundred percent shy at day right the think really? different and oh yeah all that stuff um so some really really good but stuff gets presented in these meetings which are sometimes jokes <laughs> so like i left i left four seasons and i went to went to journey's end which was an economy lodging group and shy at days pitching our pitching our business or actually i had gone to them saying we have all we have is a million dollars you guys are only working on cars exclusive in canada when that exclusive comes off, do you want a, some entertaining, goofy stuff? And and we convinced them to work. So they pitched, and their ad was a two-page spread. Again, this was magazine. It was kind of like late eight, late eighties thing, but it was a square black box, and it said, you know, Four Seasons, Yorkville, two a.m. You know, with a date, you know, three hundred and twenty-five dollars or something like that. And then a black box on the on the facing page, which said, you know, Journey's End Hotel, which was this economy it was a vertically stacked motel that we did in toronto and it was like yeah whatever 69 dollars or something like that came it was the same black box at 2 a.m and you kind of went that's freaking genius now we would never produce that but you looked at it and went wow that's very clever that gets the essence of it that's fantastic stuff but yeah with the caption stuff i just Okay, so let me, let me, well, let me maybe we ask, should describe, maybe we should ask a pro with. Uh, with yeah, Melissa. I was going to say, let's, let's do an unbiased. First off, I would like to ask an unbiased bystander. Hey, Melissa. Hi. Um, <laughs> not a disinterested bystander, hopefully. <laughs> no, no, I'm not disinterested. <laughs> she wouldn't be here if she was disinterested. But we're, I'm making a slight comment to Robert's uh, newsletter. I don't, did you get the chance to see Robert's newsletter today? I have been eyeballs deep in survey data. So, oh, yeah. Um, so, sorry, I have not had a chance to look at Oh, that. see, I just want somebody that Robert would just <laughs> Nobody ever reads it. So I literally no. just published I'm just a survey. Kidding. So, I, I'm just coming up for air. Oh, okay. 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 Well, I can't, I can't put the dagger in the heart for you, Robert, because I was really thinking Melissa would be like, agreeing with me going wow what a long conversation that was about <laughs> anyway speaking of which so it is done has it been published yet or is it, it just is literally published about 10 minutes ago Woo! that sounds like robert's newsletter <laughs> <laughs> well, we Although robert, oh, at four o'clock in the morning yeah, I would, you did four o'clock in the morning. Actually, today. A, that was... a quick question for Melissa. So Hyatt has launched a new brand, um, which is basically their version of Moxie, right? Which is is equivalent to Hilton's version of, is Tempo, 
So there's, they also have motto, which is like a micro hotel. It's smaller. I'm not, I'm not really counting, counting that. And true is like a two star property. So it's three star property, communal place, you know, two, 225 to 270 square foot, foot guest room. And yeah, it's kind of the, the central check in at the bar and stuff like that. Standard moxie type fare. Um, they have named it caption. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I looked at, yeah, C A P T I O N. And if you click on that link, I believe you will, if it's in the chat, I think you will see its logo, yes, which the is... The logo, the TikTok logo. Yeah, is it... Um, oh, wait, is that in the logo? Oh, maybe that's not in the ad. Wait a second. Where's the, uh, where's the logo? The logo... I, I uh, remember seeing it. I, I put it in the newsletter, but... Um, yeah. Let's see if I can get a... Get a link, which oh, here it is. Okay, let's see if I can find the. Oh yeah, okay. Here's I'll I'll send you to the uh, the Hyatt page. Whoops, if I can paste it into the. Uh, what a bizarre paste brand name. The what? <laughs> Option like what? It who came up with that? I'm yeah, well, click no, no, but okay, so that's Wong number one, and now click this. on click on the link. There's the link to their um to the the web page, their brand page for it. So if you click on that, oh boy, wow, that's interesting. Well, it's just oh, okay. So here's here's here. here's my theory. The agency who came up with this, because this was not internally developed at Hyatt, I would put money on. This was not like an employee recommendation. Capped is from the Latin root, which is the same like capi, like capital, the head, right? Or decapitate, right? Stuff like that. The Latin, I'm going back to my high school Latin class, right? So that's the root. So it's kind of like a head, a leader, stuff like that. You go, oh, capped is pretty, captain. Right. That's that's a good thing. But then they kind of went, well, I can't really use Captain Hotel. I don't know. How about caption? And maybe it's like it's a photo or something of the guest. And that's really what's going on. And we're just the caption to it. Or I don't know. I can't figure out. But then the logo and this may be a stretch, but it's the only logical explanation is CAPTCHA because that logo looks like a CAPTCHA. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same thing. So I'm not sure if it was a joke from the agency or, and they went with it, which has happened. And I mean, I was involved in one thing. It was a project name. It was called Barnacle. And that thing almost made it to, to market. And it was named Barnacle. So nobody would ever use that name. It was just a code name. And it got close. <laughs> sort of thing. So, Cause who wants to name a product Barnacle? It's like the worst thing you could you could be right so i i just don't get it and, and and hyatt's done some good centric the branding's great andas is is really good right you know, you kind of go through these and you go good job good job hyatt place is fine you know you kind of go through the modern brands they've had they've done a good and then you just go what <laughs> this one i don't get i really don't and I'm not trying oh, to be see, for mean, me, it's but an, it's I honestly... another one on the pile of what I don't get. It's just another one of those, really, seriously, you think this was important in the world that we had this, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, even though with Hilton, with like tempo, you kind of, oh, well, you can have a variety of tempos, but you can kind of go, okay, we're going for like a vibe or a rhythm or this is what... You, you can make a stretch. I mean, the, you know, an agency comes up with that. You can go, yeah, okay, we can work with that, right? So, or autograph, oh, right? <laughs> autograph collect. That's... You, now, Marriott screwed up autograph, and they had a TV show on, it was like TLC or something that was like Pitch the Brand, which is great if you can go find it, because I watched the show, and Marriott totally screwed up because one of the presentations was, each property is as unique as, as your autograph. And you go, oh, that's brilliant. That's what it should, I'm sure that's what the agency intended when they came up, and they didn't go that way, right? They went with something that was just really stupid, right, instead. But yeah, I don't know. But this one baffles. It really, everything about it, not the concept, the product and the brand is like, right, Moxie, you come up, fine. Great, great little brand concept. They've Hyatt has to react. No issues with that. I'm sure they'll execute the brand and operationally do just fine. 
right? But the name ain't the name and the logo ain't helping them do that. <laughs> now I'm also confused by this image at the near the top or right under the logo there in their caption by Hyatt Social Spaces. And on the column straight in the middle of the photo, there are two icons. One is for Wi-Fi and one is for Instagram. And oh, I'm that's true. Is that actually yeah. on the column? And if it is, why? And if it's just digitally put in the picture, why? <laughs> I'm very confused by this. And maybe, that's, I'm sure maybe. that's a rendering. That's, that's gotta be a, I'm trying to look at, sometimes they screw up on the. Go, uh, go ahead, Del. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's the source. Like if you're closer to it, the Wi-Fi is going to work better or something <laughs> like that. If I saw that, that I would be running to sit right there. But you're right. Yeah, Maybe it's just for the rendering. Maybe it's I, just a way of expressing this. I I think that is a that is a I I'm pretty sure based on some of the shadows that that is like an architectural rendering. Yeah, they didn't. That isn't an actual space, right? That they right. that they built out. So yeah, they must have put that. Just I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> they, they was like, hey, here's we'll put some icon, you know, uh, some iconic. What do you call it? Iconography or whatever it is um, on the walls. Yeah, I I don't know. Sometimes the hotel turns out to look just like the rendering, like amazing. And oh yeah. Sometimes yeah. not so much. Yeah. This one, I'm sure they'll probably, you know, they might change like that wall on the left with all the arrows, which is yeah. really kind of weird because you go check in and all that and you go, yeah, it's the same place. <laughs> I, I don't so. think it, I don't think it's uh, uh, not without purpose. I mean, you know that there's a thousand eyes to see this before it goes out. And that is so blatant that it was probably oh, yeah. discussed and thought through. But in lending itself to our world of uh, emoticons and everything else like this, I think it's an abbreviated thing of saying share this or this is a place that is pretty and colorful enough. That, because it, it, look what they're doing in the background. The person is taking a, person, a picture of a person with that background behind there. So they're yeah. purposely indicating this is of that genre where that's yeah. what you do. There's We've got an weird. Instagrammable hotel. Yes, that's pretty much what they're really pushing out is that. Look, we're going to put some really cool stuff up on the walls. Obviously, the one to the left that has the fitness center check-in is not one of those things you're going to really like. Well, okay, why would I do that? Yeah. Or, but but that that colorful background is, hey, look where I'm at, or cool place, or you know, affirmationally, look, I picked the best place to be at because it's got a cool backdrop. Whatever yeah. that Instagram mentality of of sharing is. What yeah, really just a pushing. reminder. Oh, Instagram, let me let me post something, and especially yeah. people love murals. Oh Instagram God, yes. Show. Well, well oh, look at the wing mural in yeah. LA. It, it became famous because of that. You know, they yeah. painted yeah. it specifically so you could stand in and have wings and yeah. you know, whatever. But. Well, and and again, the actually the main competitor these guys are going after is Citizen M, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's 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 a bit. And Citizen yeah. M, I mean, you walk into a, and I love Citizen M's, right? I, I oh. just think they do an excellent, excellent job. But even you look at like the little knickknacks on the, you know, those kind of tiered shelving things, and you're like. Yeah, that's not very cool stuff. That's just like generic, you know, IKEA has that, right? <laughs> so, so, so maybe maybe so, it's yeah, my, I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't really get it. Well, see, so. maybe it's my old gymness in this, but um the furniture is is, is the way I look at it, I look at the durability function of it and oh, it looks yeah. like it's all replaceable. Like, okay, we're gonna change motifs quite a lot because this stuff it's isn't gonna, gonna last very long. Yeah, it's gonna wear out <laughs> fast. <laughs> Single yeah. post tables. That small, that slender, do not last. No. Slap somebody's 80 pound uh, suitcase on it because they want to go over and open it up and that thing snaps like a twig. Oh, yeah, the, the chair, kind of that, that um, kind Bit of metal. Deep square yeah. one. Yeah. Well, no, the one, you know, people sitting on the edge of that, that's good. That's going to wear out with that seam oh, on yeah, the top. Yeah. So it's, it's just, just not, yeah. Yeah, deep and those chairs don't work do well happen. either. Just, yeah. Yeah, just, those things no. do happen. I think I've told the story on this, the show before. Um, when we opened the Mandalay Four Season, this was way back in the early in the early eighties. We did this amazing dining room, but the guy, the designer, just went nuts, right? And the the banquet fabric was this beautiful silk, three hundred dollars a yard. I don't know what it would be now, right? But it was just this incredible. And you're like, you know, when somebody we're serving red wine here, <laughs> and as soon as somebody drops something on there, we got to replace that whole pan. Yeah, you, know, you can't afford to have this fabric. 
you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's just, you know, crazy, crazy stuff. And well, you, eventually you, they yeah. had to, right? They yeah, ripped they, it all out and put in new stuff because they're like, yeah, we can't just. I'm even you know, seeing the shelving is that, in, that, that kind of industrial buy off the shelf shelving right by the front desk. If you look at it, it's that. Oh, yeah. You know, metal metal uh, racking kind of stuff with wood panel, wood, wood plate uh, shelves and yeah. stuff. Just, it's not yeah. durable. It's meant to. It's kind of almost indigoish. Like, okay, it's going to get pulled out anyway and replaced with something else. It might right. get rotated through, but it's not going to stay there if it, if it, you know, for any length of time. So, yeah. but indigo is like a two star, right? So, yeah. Yeah. No. so I don't know. I, I honestly, yeah, kind of like true, right? I mean, true was kind I, of the indigo compliment, yeah sort of thing right, right. maybe maybe ihg is like no that's a four star i mean i don't know these are so so tying <laughs> to something that came up all this week on clubhouse here we have a new brand they're launching out a brand mission they're launching out a brand product they're launching launching out what they're having as a brand promise and yet the reality right now is we can't even staff the brands that are currently running with the promises that they've already made well, that doesn't have anything to do with anything, Warren. It's no, development. No, 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 it's pipeline. We're talking about pipeline and stuff like that. <laughs> it, because <laughs> if anything that's resonated this whole week has been the persistent, if, if it wasn't us bringing it up in topic as moderators, it was people bringing it up when brought to the stage as people contributing. Over that, and over every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the coffee talk and the lunchtime, right. I'm yeah. almost numb to hearing about the shortage of help at this point. <laughs> yeah, and 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 the the silliness. I mean, um, Robert, just to reiterate, what is your four steps of how hospitality handles crisis? Well, in the first step, it's to ignore it. Step exactly. two, <laughs> when told by individuals, you know, this is going to be an issue, right? And I believe on this show we have discussed from you know a big thing coming out of this thing is how are you going to ramp back up from low occupancy to to higher and spikes and irregular and not consistent that's going to be very difficult how are you going to stuff they continue to ignore it <laughs> step two. three is you panic which is i think kind of the phase we're in yeah. right now mm -hmm. and then phase four is you complain which we're rolling into quite quickly. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Maybe, oh, they already transitioned to phase four. Okay. Yeah, I think I think already there's something. Because we as a industry, and I'm, I don't think we're alone in this, but we, we will point out to ours, has done the thing that we said we would, should never do, and that is overpromise and underdeliver. And we are persistently doing, oh, I have 100 rooms to sell. I can only feasibly staff 50 room oh. inventory, but I can sell 100 because they'll right now it, it's- They'll figure it out. <laughs> right. This and what they've the ended up doing is pissing off 100 plus guests compared yeah. to satisfying 50 guests. And of course, they've already done the other stupid thing, which is lower their rates, thinking that was going to generate uh, a business prior to. Um, and now they're faced with the fact that even though they're jacking up rates, they're not delivering on that promise of anything. And they're getting a lot of people that they may have gotten the dollar now, but they lost the $10 lifetime or the $15 lifetime. Well, and, and they're putting the rates back up and they're still, the services aren't there, right? They right. aren't getting daily maid or housekeeping services. They aren't getting, um, well, that's even know, a positive. That's, stuff, that's even a right? positive. That the fact the that grab and go stuff that isn't same there, level of breakfast is shut down. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. Right. right? Yeah. So we, we yeah. actually have some cost savings. There was a great article recently in, on hospitality net that discussed the cost savings associated with the new expected protocols for housekeeping and food service and everything else. The diminished requirements of, of what's going on, the, the, the fact that daily housekeeping is probably a thing of the past and is a feature now rather than a mainstay from before. Oh, it's going to be a revenue stream too, because yeah. then it's they're going to reintroduce for a fee of, which will be very interesting to see if they decide to go for 10 bucks or 50 bucks and where that, I'm sure there's there are a couple analysts at the major hotel groups just running a lot of scenarios they're going can we test this how do we test this yeah. you know yeah. when they were giving a discount if you right first, oh or points you yeah you get game. you get it was points. five dollars which right. i thought was uh, it to me in a new york city hotel that seemed very low considering mm -hmm. what we pay housekeepers in new york sure. yeah but now that I've heard what people pay housekeepers in other places, like under nine dollars in some oh, places. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I can understand them giving five dollars, but not well, and the only people. reason they're paying nine is they had to compete and go above minimum wage to get, yeah, you know, to get somebody. But now they're competing with groups like 
Amazon, right? Mm-hmm. Because Amazon, the lowest any at any place in the nation is 15, right? Mm. So right there, it's like, well, what do I want to do? Uh, yeah, ha- housekeeping is a physical, highly active on your feet for, you know, eight hour shifts and things like that. It's getting pretty close to, to Amazon. A, and I then what kind one. of benefits are they getting, right? Because a lot of hoteliers have gone to, you know, we can contract these people and have them come in and go out and things like that. We don't have to give them all sorts of what do you do to lower the... I, I, was, talking to talking. I was talking to somebody that I was talking to during a few months ago, and they were talking about the fact that they had cut themselves back. And I was chiding them a little bit. I'm like, wow, you, you really, I mean, you just let people go. Like, hey, don't have any business. Sorry, don't need you. And like, that's kind of cold considering, you know, you, you already had a market that you were having a hard time getting people. This was in South Florida on the small little islands that run out the Anyway, um, and I was telling him, like, you should rethink how you handle this to preempt yourself in the future tense that you can bring them back readily. And I, we talked about training. We talked about giving them some sort of value just to be held around so they would be first back. Didn't. Uh, now, all of a sudden, they're, you know, to the wall with business. And these people basically said, no, I'm sorry. Uh, one, I've gone over here, which offered more than you did. Two, um, the, the people that he was able to scrape back were totally untrained and they had no training in place. So most of the time- Now, did they have any experience at all? Most of them, no. No, most then, of them, no. And then so really, what they yeah. what ended up doing was the people that did have any level of experience, all they could have them do was run trash bags or refill carts or- you know, things that didn't require anything other than telling them what to do rather than knowing what to be done. So you still had the same limitation of one person knowing how to actually clean a room in the instance of housekeeping and two or three people that were warm bodies that were just doing nothing more than running towels to the cart that the person was needing and taking trash bags out that they were taking from the room and no time to teach people how to actually do the process. And all of this was stuff I'm just I'm literally listening to him complain about. I'm like, wow, I have a whole pile of I told you so behind me that I'm not going to bring up because oh, I had this conversation with you. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the key question for that individual is like, wow, so how many rooms are you cleaning a day? And the answer will be zero. Generally here's the problem speaking. With down there. No, no, but here's the problem. Yeah, he does. <laughs> no, he isn't. But here's the problem down there. With it being fishing season and things like this, mm-hmm. these are not rooms you can let go for any length of time. Because unfortunately, most people at this particular hotel, not exactly the ones worrying about the condition of the room at any one particular time, thinking that when they leave it the way ever they leave it, they come back and a little else. Hey, if it. you're cleaning fish, okay, if you get onto kind of the you know the credenza or something like that, next you can watch TV and clean them right there. There you and go, it works and really, it works out really well. It works really well because the bathroom and stuff you can't really see the. No, TV no, I'm talking and, about the towels yeah, and yeah. the <laughs> shower and the bathroom and the counter oh, yeah. jobs and yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, sand, seen, yeah, sand fish pictures. guts, not good. Go ahead, Adele, sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I've seen pictures with tissues all over the floor, and I was trying to figure out why are there tissues all over the floor, and then I realized they didn't want to walk on the floor, so they just took all the toilet paper <laughs> and all the Kleenex and lined the, the floor of the room so they can walk on Kleenex instead. The towels work better Imagine. for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the choo-choo train <laughs> walk. You take the towel with the street, you do the choo-choo train. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, by the way, I was totally, I was I was actually distracted with Melissa because you, you gave us the link to your thing. So I started reading some of the numbers. And Dean, nice to see you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm catching up on the chat menu over there. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, Melissa, please, you have, I'm dying for new revelations on what you found so far. What changes have may have happened out of the things that you've done since the last survey? Because obviously there are some from what even a little bit I was able to look at. There are some changes and we asked a new question pertaining to people's vaccination status and what their intentions are. And then I was able to analyze all these questions by their vaccination status, and it made me hate people more than I already do. (laughs) So, (laughs) and that's a tough statement because if you ask Stuart, he will tell you, I just generally don't like people. (laughs) Anywho. (laughs) All right, I'm gonna caveat this entire conversation before somebody else brings it up that so this leisure travel study is one mostly north american mostly east coast and it does skew towards 
an older demographic. So when we ask this question about the vaccination status, this is going to be a bit skewed more than, you know, the quote unquote general travel population. So I'm going to caveat all that with that statement. That said, so we had over 2,600 respondents on this round of the survey, which wow. is pretty good considering good. that, uh, you know, we're on number 12 at this point. Um, and almost 50% of the people surveyed said that they are fully vaccinated. Another nearly 20% have had their first shot and they're waiting on the second. We had much smaller groups of people saying that they've scheduled their first shot or they're waiting to be eligible. And then we have the people who are either unsure or definitely not getting vaccinated. Yeah. And those two are up to 30%, right? Yes, that is And fair. that, you need, you need to, get to get to 70 at least to, to kind of get herd immunity, which all of a sudden you go, this may be a problem, considering these aren't kids either. So you've got that whole population of children too. So yes, yeah. this so, is an issue. <laughs> yeah, and given, so given the fact, knowing that this survey skews older and still 30%, are either unsure or not getting the vaccine frightens the crap out of me to be perfectly yeah, honest. But if you want this thing to last because the last year has just been so great, you can keep this going on forever. Really? If you want. <laughs> so, uh, so the, yet the, at the same, at the same time that they say that and not to jump ahead too far, but one of the questions that I really liked on there was question number 12 about what is keeping you from travel and the vast majority said nothing is keeping me from travel. Yeah. So I'm not going to get the shot and I'm not afraid to travel. Uh, yep. Damn the torpedoes. Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah. So uh, I know that we are speaking and people who may be listening to this don't have access to this at the moment, but I really do want to talk about this very first word cloud that we've had on every survey since we started this, which is asking people the first word they think of when they're tra about travel right now. So again, as a whole, if you look at the whole group of respondents, safety is still the big giant word on the screen. We did get some more, you know, fun related freedom, finally relaxation, those type of words from all respondents. All the other groups broken down by their vaccination status looked more like this all respondent group, except for the people not getting the vaccine. Their giant word was fun, followed by ready and excited. Safety yeah. is a little tiny word on this word. <laughs> this word <Yep>. line. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. YOLO. Well, okay. I mean, not to throw politics to this, but there is a certain elitism that is beginning to become very prevalent in per people's perceptions. Um, you know, it, it kind of lends itself. We make fun of history where we say, oh, well, the, you know, the European elitism, the royals versus the non-royals, if for lack of a better analogy to it, of I, it's okay for me to do it at any detriment of anyone else because I'm, I'm more privileged or have more reason to think that I can get away with doing what I'm doing than somebody else that has to suffer for my decisions. That, that, non-community feel that it's me, it's all about me. We can translate it to nationalism in a recent political environment, um, but that, that emerged from all of this. Um, but that is still prevalent where people are. I had a very uncomfortable conversation with a client base about um, the ownership of the group wanted to go over and ask the team, everybody then all hotel owners to go over and uh, hotels that, that, in their organization to get vaccinated. They said, we wanted to ask everyone to get vaccinated. <sighs> Ooh, did that not go well? Because then all the tears within the organization had an opinion about the affrontedness of being uh, asked to do something they didn't want to do. It's their right to do what they want to do, to decide what they want to do. And even though I interjected the conversation of, you do know this is the way our industry is going to have a shorter timeline of recovery is if we do get to this vaccination level where it's not always in the news and always hurting people, not the news aspect, but actually hurting people, you know, dying, getting sick, things like this. It's only 560 some thousand, Lauren. I mean, come on. It's a small <laughs> number, right? Unless you're <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, and I know three of them. So to me, it's very oh, much yeah. about this, yeah. and, and 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 for them to go through that, and 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 when when I actually I went I made it really uncomfortable because I actually pushed on one about what was well when it's not studied enough yet. There's not enough people that have taken it. I said, so okay, let's go with this. What is a good number? I mean, I'm not yeah. asking you to be a statistician, but I'm asking you quantifiably, what is the number in your mind that is sufficient? Well, a more. No, 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 no. That's not a number. That's a that's an ending thing. What is the number undefined? Okay, uh, that that they've proven that it doesn't work. What number is that exactly? You know, how many people does that have to quantify that it is safe for that? Then you feel what number? Well, more than what's now. Mm, again, not a number. It's a direction. I mean, I was really. I probably could have gotten fired for being. An, I mean, but to me, it was like one of these. Come on, people! If you really sit down and try to understand this. I can understand the legitimate argument of someone that is thinking about having a child and they're uncertain about the ramifications of the medication. Totally understand that. <clears throat> I'm a little iffy on the religious thing because I'm really re pretty iffy about the religious thing anyway, um, about the I don't take vaccinations thing. I figure God gave us brains to figure out how to so solve our problems. So that's why we have vaccines. So, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But the idea that there's this unquantified criteria of people before they make the choice of taking it and it's their right to take it or not take it is one thing, but it is a business decision for a business. And then the hospitality to say, Hey, look, uh, I think we should all take vaccines. Not because I want to PR piece it, which I would, I would say, Hey guys, guess what? We're, we're all vaccinated. So if you're worried about that, our team is vaccinated, but just from the good sense that it helps our industry by promoting vaccinations in and itself should be the merit for the effort. And Even if you're not saying they have to, but we encourage you. How can right. we encourage you to do it? Hey, I'll give you more vacation time. Okay. I so, think that Yeah. So that's the thing. Okay. So I did that. I said, so if I gave you 50 bucks, I said, would you take the vaccine? No. How about if I give you 500? Well, yeah. Okay. So it's not no. really a moral so there is a <laughs> But again, again, you look at groups like Amazon, right? Amazon is is giving and again. Amazon hired half a million people, a lot of which came from in a year, right? Which is just this, where'd they come from? My guess is a lot came from service industries and things like that who had no work. Oh, I know people firsthand that that's what they've gotten from. Yes. Right. Me. So, but, but <laughs> what's Amazon the doing? Day. They're paying, they're paying $40 per shot, right? They're giving people time off. So it isn't against their vac. They don't have to take vacation. It's like, you can take the day off. I, it may be unpaid, but still they're, they're giving people flexibility, but they're giving them four, 40 bucks a shot to go do it. Their benefits cover it. So it's not like they have to pay anything from, from that basis. And my understanding is they, they were doing a ton of testing right before like on-site testing for their employees like at any time right and you aren't getting docked for not working or or whatever you can go get tested yeah if you need it um but they're trying i think once they get enough vaccine they're going to have it set up in the you know in their fulfillment centers just yeah. going you want it boom you don't have it go sort and of i will thing. grant and, you yeah. you know i will grant you i wasn't too gung-ho about getting it in january I, not that I could have anyway, because I didn't fall into the criteria, but I, I don't know if I would have been too gung-ho about that. We're in April now, folks. Millions of people, to Lauren's point, what's the number, right? Millions of people have had the shot now. Were there a few bad examples? Well, yeah, of course there were. There will be with every single vaccination yeah. ever. Uh, but the vast majority of them did exactly and are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And 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 things bad things happen to people who don't get vaccinated too, and and those have repercussions. So yeah. you, some of the repercussions might have happened anyway, and some of the repercussions would definitely have been more certain if you got COVID. Oh, oh. absolutely. Yeah. So uh, with that, Melissa, hey. Oh, oh the one. Th hang on. The <laughs> one thing. Here's the rationale. I normally don't. I like to leave the rut row for last, but the rut row this week was the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is just great. It's basically the combination of ignorance and overconfidence, right? How that affects intuitive thinking. And they have a lovely little chart if you click on the click on the link. And I'm sorry, Ed's not here for this. I mean, it's just, <laughs> what are you trying to say about Ed? <laughs> well, no, no, but you have the confidence. They, they basically have a, a chart with 
the y-axis is confidence, right? And the x-axis is expertise, right? And basically at the y-axis, you have this sharp uptick of, of people who are very confident, who are doing this. They have no expertise, right? But they're just sure of what they know. And then it kind of, as the expertise increases, then, okay, there's going to be less. And then all of a sudden it curves back up as they're an expert and they know exactly like what's what's going on, right? But yeah, it's... um. Yeah, I, I didn't know the name of it, but it's the Dunning Kruger effect, and that's our problem. They got all these people who I'm not listening to the doctor. I know it's <laughs> so, an interesting uh, point because it starts off easy. with that ignorance is bliss status, where uh, I, I think I know everything. I've got the, the confidence. As you become more of an expert on it, like you said, that graph goes down because yeah. now I've gotten to the point where at least I know what I don't know. And I can look at it and go, okay, yeah, I don't know that. And that's where your confidence wanes a little bit because you know you don't know it. Eventually, you get to that point where, though, your expertise and your confidence match up there. Yeah. So I would like to bring back to Melissa because I know yeah. she has cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa? Okay. So um, we, again, asked if people have actually traveled since the pandemic started. And this number we've asked, this question a few times now and and the yes no percentage really hasn't changed over time but on this round we now have this vaccine status to compare to and there was definitely some differences there not surprisingly i guess but we had 71 percent of those that are not getting the vaccine who have traveled 66 percent who were unsure about getting the vaccine have traveled and then we go down the road 53 percent only 53% who are fully vaccinated have traveled. <laughs> like, yeah. mm. what? They're still being you know cautious, though. Of, They're still, yeah. It, it reminds me of a car, somebody that bought a car but ran out of gas. There, I think there's a lot of people that have become fully vaccinated, but for two things. I mean, I'm being trite about it, but one is financially that means isn't available to them right now. Two, uh, because of the hesitancy of others and or the concern that there's most people that don't, there's still the reluctance of, okay, because they're, they're, they're good, potentially, I'm not trying to generalize them, potentially they're just good hard people knowing that by wearing a mask, I'm preventing both of us from not getting sick potentially as much. Right. And so by getting the vaccination, it means I'm not going to have the likelihood of getting sick that much, but it doesn't mean I cannot you know, make me make you ill, so I'm still gonna wear a mask. Right. Those people are probably the core of those that aggregation of saying, you know, I just don't feel good about traveling yet because I may, maybe I am a, an a, asymptomatic person and I did get the vaccine and I'm not going to get it myself and for you know for, with a high degree of certainty but it doesn't mean I still can't create the problem for somebody else so therefore I just don't see it in my plans and also I ran out of money and I can't go well or maybe. what are they going to do right because still a lot of you know are they going to go to large events and they aren't going to concerts and things you know you think of all the different demand generators if those let's go to new york oh want to see a broadway show no nope, that's not going to happen so all of a sudden you know the the value proposition or or the the value derived and all those memories and great things you go uh oh we've got a subset of that right mm -hmm. so maybe we'll wait and i've got to think once broadway reopens there's going to be pent up demand and it's, it's going to be, you know, great sort of thing. I mean, you see what the Texas Rangers for opening day got 40,000 yeah. people with I, no limitation. I, I go, actually wow. had to, chide, I had to right? chide one of my friends because they made a joke about Darwinism. I said, this is nothing to joke about. This is just sad. It's just a oh, sad yeah. perception that people feel so comfortable that a politician says it's now okay that they rip off their masks and thinking they're being told by Buddha that it, this is this is all fixed now and they go crowd up and get drunk and hang and kiss and hug and all this other stuff and and yeah you can be you can be mean about it saying ignorance or whatever but the reality of it is it's sad cuz somebody's going to suffer for that well and yeah. and it's not just darwin because they aren't affecting themselves they're affecting the other Everybody. people right they're putting other people at risk not just themselves right yeah. which is yeah and i'm not i don't, don't want to be that gloom and doom i don't want to sit down in a bomb shelter thinking the world's going to end so i'm just going to sit here until it does not at all i i think there is this and vaccines aren't the end all be all we know that already we know there's percent it's a numbers game it's a numbers game we just saw that they paused uh pfizer because of six people you may think uh, johnson and johnson and johnson and well, Johnson Johnson too, but Pfizer too. Pfizer, but Pfizer. They they're... paused Pfizer. No, I haven't seen the Pfizer one. No, 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 no. Sorry, it's not paused. They, they, they created concern over <laughs> Pfizer 
for having to have the third vaccine because they're lowering the percentages of, of impact for the Pfizer is what they're saying. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry. But yeah. yes, well, Johnson, boosters, Johnson. Yeah, and Moderna yeah. came out and said, yeah, you're probably going to need a booster in the fall. But the right. booster, oh. the booster, they're saying, hey, our stuff is still good for six months, which is great. But because of the variants and things like that, they're, they're treating it like the flu vaccine. They're like, you know what? We're probably going to have to retool this to, to make As it variations effective. Come up. Yep. Because if you don't, you're going to wind up. If you, with... if you look at if you look at the information that is the scientific information, so how these things are built, it's fascinating how those things work. Fake news, yeah, Stuart. Thank you for beeping your microphone off, by the way, so we can talk about you. Ha ah. <laughs> ha. <laughs> but no, if, going back to the point of it being six people, statistically, it's almost irrelevant unless you're one of the six mm -hmm. people. Yeah, and then it's very relevant. And yes, if there is any propensity for an awareness of if I have this certain condition with platelets, I should not take this vaccine in particular, that should be well known. That should be something that goes into the process going forward of, by the way, here's some conditional requirements. Just like allergy questions you get with your doctor every time you go in to see them, what are you allergic to? To make sure you're not prescribed something that can create an adverse reaction to you. You shouldn't be given a vaccine for this. But the science of some of these things for all three of them, really, but for mainly Moderna and Pfizer, it's amazing. The opportunities that it presents itself and how this is carried into the system has really cool, big, huge, positive effects on cancer treatments and everything else. Because if it works the way it does for what they built it for for COVID, that's pretty cool. Well, the mRNA yeah. stuff, so yeah, it's pretty, it, it, it has some tremendous, yeah, you know, some tremendous potential that needs a lot of research and some other, other things. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Uh, it's hey, let's crazy. talk about Stuart's answer his microphone on because yeah. we can pick on it. Doesn't make any. Again, it doesn't make any sense. It makes as much sense as naming a brand caption. I don't know. Ooh, no, I think that's a spiffy name. I think that's a spiffy name. <laughs> or having a name like Stuart Butler from New Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, New Guinea. Guinea I thought he was Tonga. Go right ahead. It's not Tonga. Oh, no, oh, no. Well, it could be. You know, you never know. Well, okay. It's the Commonwealth. Whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, Robert, that caption logo that you were alluding to, the one, th one thing you didn't say about it, my first impression, is it looked like one of those things where I had to put on those red and blue 3D glasses. Yeah, TikTok, it's a TikTok logo. It's a TikTok logo. It's meant to be 3D-esque. Yeah, oh, is it's that not. <laughs> I think it's more like a CAPTCHA. I don't know. But, uh, uh, no, yeah, you see. should see it reproduced. And I, I did it like in black and white, or if you put it on a... Um, you know, like a dark background versus a regular white back, it gets really funky really quick. I bet it does. <laughs> so, yeah. so, Ms. Melissa, what other insights came from the new new version 12? All right. So we asked how many trips people have taken since the pandemic. And again, these numbers really haven't changed over the last few times we've asked the question. But again, now we have this little vaccination status data point. So in general, um, most people have traveled at least two times since the pandemic of those people who have traveled, but 80% of those that are not getting a vaccine have traveled more than once where compared to the whole group were like, you know, between 65 and 70%. So let me digest that. So 80% of the people who were not getting a shot have traveled more than once. Because more than they once. Love, let me rephrase of the people who have traveled. And the people who are not getting a vaccine, 80% have traveled more than once. Right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And um, how does this thing get transmitted? Oh, it's them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess, you know, it's kind of like a fright, a, a, a fear, and then you, you, you try and it's not as scary as you thought it was, and then you get used to the fear and it dulls it, and oh, you yeah. just think that that's a part of, what you know, I, 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 that's the best I can have for because to me it's like I talk to people that have traveled. I, I wish Stephanie was on the show with us today. She traveled ten times in two months or something, and she went through the whole five stages of grief or something. I, I mean, just the total fear the first time, the lesser fear the second time, and eventually it was just this is what I do, this is how I handle it, and this is what I do to cope with it. It just turned into a new norm. Oh God, I hate the term, but you know, for her and how she travels, she referred to it as like. Yeah, I take the precautions, but it's not the fear that drives it anymore. It's just the precautions to be safe. You know, just like fastening a seatbelt in a car, you could be phobic about it and not you know, have the fear of even driving out of the driveway because of all the potential for accident. Or you could just realize that's a aspect that you try to mitigate. Um, 
I, I guess that's probably the best way of having it because even in strong, strange, strange small ways, as my, our friends are getting fully vaccinated, they are deciding to plan parties outdoors, pool parties, because it's still beautiful weather. It's getting warmer, actually. And um, it, the new norm is, and to keep everyone updated for the COVID information, these are all the people that are coming to the party, to, you know, numerically, and their status of vaccination. And, you know, there's a party that's coming up for us, and there's a couple that aren't that are coming that are not vaccinated because they don't want to be vaccinated. Great people. That The weird part of it is that you look at the world, it's like, these aren't really bad people. These are just people that have the perception of what they do and they, this is the value that they have. And and you know, we're sitting back going, okay, it's outdoors. We can keep distance. We know who they are. You know, how bad is bad? We're going to be fully vaccinated by that point. You know, we're, you're mentally clicking through these things. And it's, first off, it's a pain in the ass that we have to. Okay, but it's not under our control to change that. Uh, but the other is, is that you actually have to make that as a criteria as to your assessment as to risk. We're all doing risk factor analysis now. What's the risk factor? It's you know? the risk versus the incentive, right? And well, I'll, I'll give you a great and pool floating with lots of good food, but that's just well, I'm yeah. Well, no, but I'll, I'll give you a great example. My wife works at this very high end, high end preschool here in Dallas, right? And they are very strict. I mean, a kid gets or the the parent is diagnosed with COVID. The kid was in class. They shut that down immediately, right? And everybody's out for two weeks, and you know, and the parents don't love that scenario. Right, because they're come on, was he close? It's like, hey, he was in the room this time, there's exposure done. And they're paying zero for it anyway, even though they're not in school. Oh, yeah, well, but oh no, they, they shift to they shift to online, right? They're able to do that, right? So they'll, they'll do it online, everything's everything's fine, but they aren't physically in class. That's and a lot of nannies are bringing these kids anyway, right? The, the, for the reality of it, except there's one parent who goes, oh my God, it's really, really upset about, no, has to be in there. We got to go. He can't be quarantined. We're like, wait, what's the, what's the problem? He goes, I have 40 people coming to my house Friday night. And it's like, oh, <laughs> this has nothing to do with the welfare of your kid or spreading any. So their incentive is whatever to have these 40 people over for whatever reason. Right. Um, but yeah, they just kind of waited out and it's like, yeah, Johnny's maybe Johnny's sick. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's infected them. They're having the 40 people. They're preparing all the food. I don't know, but they're going to run with it. Right. That's their own personal risk assessment. And again, back at the beginning of the pandemic, that one meeting in Boston generated, I can't remember how many, like 3000 cases. Right. Because it was just Nobody knew about it. There was no, there was no social distancing. There was nothing going on, right? No masks. And it just wildfire. Right? And again, in different states, all back to that one meeting at, at what, a Seaport sure. Hotel or whatever in Boston. It's just crazy. But again, sure. these people know it. It's a year later. And they're so, smart so people. They're educated. They're executives the, and companies, right? Yeah. Twisting this to a marketing perspective, I've, I'm a little surprised because I've, I've had some success with some of the marketing strategy of the FOMO issue. You know, we often talk back before all of this happened, spas. We're very good about being that aloof. If you didn't pre-plan, you were out. Like, oh, we're going to go to this place because it's a spa there and it's going to be, you're going to love it. And then you show up and you didn't make the reservation that you should have made weeks ago. And the opportunity for you to go to the spa does not exist because there is a limited amount of inventory and you didn't make a reservation. And unless somebody cancels, uh, you're out and the spa is not a function of your stay at the resort. That FOMO aspect, uh, we've begun to chase people or businesses around us down that have limitations, whether, you know, legally, municipal, you know, wise or what have you. But if they still have seating restrictions, asking that we can have a level of, of accessibility that we can offer our guests for early reservations. Like, hey, this is a super cool restaurant. Uh, limited seating, they do, they are open and it is convenient to the property. Uh, but if you're going to book with us and you want this res restaurant to be a, a part of your itinerary, here's the link for our priority booking capability for you to get a room or excuse me, a, a seat at it before you get here. Why isn't people doing more of this aspect? I don't understand because in all honesty, we are still in lots of markets having that restrictive capability. The places that open up free for Melissa, I told your story, probably embellished it more than it was real about what you had for your restaurant adventure. You know, I, I, did you really have to kill three people is what I just, I, I don't know. I just, I said three, it could have been more, but. <laughs> Hazmat suits, yeah. Yeah, 
you know, you did the whole ninja thing with the but anyway. So, but but the the under you know the overpromise under deliver kind of mentality. Why not adapt that collaboration? Saying, look, staying with us gives you value beyond just the fact that you're staying with us. We're giving you accessibility to things priority wise. Where I'm actually having a group right now reach out to the museum that has by reservation only attendance in the area and saying, hey, can you create this thing for us that we have a certain allotment that we can guarantee we have access to? And of course, any means for our people to go over and reserve with you that they can be given that, you know, that prioritization being placed in. And yes, there's compensation involved in all this other stuff. It's not just a gimme uh, kind of thing, but, you know, scratch my back, I scratch yours kind of mentality. I can give you people. Um, and and they're interested in it. Just, you know, just creating those collaborations. I don't see why we can't adapt to the current world, which is there are limitations to certain functions and things and places. And why not, because you're a neighbor and you're in the same community, create some sort of relationship value that you can offer? Oh, just marketing thought. But you have two different camps now. I mean, the marketing has almost become tribal, right? So um, my wife, this is a couple weeks ago, I went down to visit my, my daughter and we, you know, we're fully vaccinated and not, that's all fine and good. Right. So we go and we go to this little town, which is outside of Austin called Wimberley. And it's a cute little touristy type town, but in this, the windows, there are two, one is masks required, right, right on the door and things like that. And then there are other ones that say masks, not all in caps, underscored in re not required. Right. And there are people fl going into one and we heard people commenting, oh, I'm not going in there. They require masks. I'm going in there. Right. And then exactly the opposite, depending on people's political persuasion, whatever the case may be. Right. And you just looked and went, this is just not great. But pe like, people are capitalizing on certain things, but it, it's this weird tribal thing. Right. And again, it has nothing to do with public health <laughs> in some cases. Well, listen. So. On, on your numbers with it, it seems that June is still the benchmark of interest for peak travel that people think they're going to be traveling. May, is that inconsistent May, with you? Yeah. yeah. For the next trip, not for this. They may also be going in July and August, right? Correct. Sure. That's mm -hmm. the next trip. So they're the early. Oh, that's the next round early. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> is it? So... I mean, I, I went through a pessimistic stage where in January, I was very optimistic from your last the, the report you had in January of like, oh my gosh, we should start, you know, January is the planning month. I mean, I remember having it on the show. We're talking about this is the month for planning. We should be going over and opening up the uh, marketing plan here and getting people interested in booking with us because it looks like summer is optimistically when people are going to be floodgating out and doing all this. And then all of a sudden we start getting the bad variant news, the bad distribution of vaccination news. We had January 6th obviously happen all this other stuff. <clears throat> and then I got into real pessimistic mode, which was, oh, gloom and doom. It's not going to be till the end of the year if we're lucky. And, you know, I went into this whole alternate cycle of, nope, doesn't look like it's really going to happen. It's too many false starts. This isn't the time. This isn't going to happen. But from what you're seeing in the numbers, it's still, st it, it's still relevant that that's people's perception of their first opportunity for travel or their willingness to have the first opportunity for travel. Well, I can tell you having now met with all of my local clients in Myrtle Beach, and again, I know this is specific to Myrtle Beach, but um, looking at booking windows of people who booked during the month of March for the first time in months now, we're finally getting out of that zero to seven day window. We had a load of bookings in like 90 plus days out. So people finally are shopping and booking long term and feeling okay committing outside of this weekend and yeah. waiting for, you know, to see what the weather is going to be like to see if they're going to come to the beach. So I mm -hmm. think that is extremely encouraging for mm -hmm. summer, for okay. sure. I'd love to see all these breakouts on all the, you know, all the charts that you had broken out for the vaxxers versus, you know, the non-vaxxers. I just think that would be, you, know, you start looking at age and gender and edu you know, all that sort of stuff. I, I think that would be, you know, fascinating because it may inform some marketing decisions because I, I, I hate to say it, but the opportunistic hotels will look at it and go, well, here are the people who are traveling. Let's get them, you know, let's get them in here. That may not be good for public but again it's you know each each individual has to do their own thing right so well, i think all signs that we see still show consistently 
a strong summer ahead. That, that there's a lot of we, we we all talked about the red vents travel what have you and so forth. I think the summer is going to be very strong and and maybe even in cases where it shouldn't be. Uh, so that right. may even be to a detriment. I think my bigger concern is what happens after the summer, uh, because if that business travel doesn't pick up and we get past the summer, Q4, late Q3 could be problematic. Yeah. Kind of in oh, the yeah. reverse perfect storm, because here we are, we talked about labor. Obviously, we started a conversation a little bit about that. <clears throat> and we're in this perfect storm of there's not enough labor. And part of the contribution and uh, interpretation of contribution to this part of the perfect storm is that people are able to get enough monies from the unemployment process right now than they would be going back to lesser paid hourly positions. Okay, I, I don't buy into it as much as it's leaned, leaned into, but it, I'm sure it's a contributing factor to some people's decisions. Like why work when I can make as much or if not more currently, and then when that runs out, I go get a job or go back and get a job. Because right now there seems to be such a high demand for it. We are so stumbling over ourselves in bad service and we are so stumbling over that the people are probably over. We've already made that come before. People are probably spending past their financial means for their first travel experience because they just need to get out and they will go beyond their means to do so to be able to make that happen, regardless of their future financial security. Um, and now all of a sudden they go out and they burst out and they do this travel that we're talking about. Boom. Yay. I got my trip. out. You know, I got my trip out and everything. Then they go over and. They don't have the monies to do anything more again. Now they're running out of monies that was being given to them and they're now looking for a job. And because of all that reverse uh, boom, you have a lot of people that aren't going to travel looking for a job that the industry doesn't need them for anymore because there's less people traveling. It's the mirror to what we're just now talking about. You have a lot of people that are wanting to look for a job. We don't have a job to give them because we don't have the business to give them a reason to have a job. Is that a possibility? You know, I... I think, you know, the, when I first started uh, watching this a year ago, I thought, well, even when things come back, people aren't going to rush and immediately book travel because we're all, you know, uh, we're all out of pocket for a lot of money that we might have made. But the fact is, that's only in the hospitality industry. And supposedly, overall in the country, the unemployment rate is very low. It's just for us that it seems dire. So, and of course, there are people that are underemployed or employed, you know, may do with some, some other type of job. But in reality, I've been told, because I watch CNBC every day, that that people are stockpiling their money there they, because they haven't traveled, because they haven't gone out to restaurants, because they haven't had to buy fancy dresses to, um, uh, and they're, and they're wearing yoga pants like I am right now. <laughs> they haven't had to buy fancy shoes because flip flops will do at a time like this. So people not so, having to commute into New York city are like millionaires yeah. now, like not right. having to pay the <laughs> over the bridge every day. Millionaires. Well, yeah. And they're paying, they're paying they're paying down credit card debt and they're yeah. actually making some good responsible financial, you know, personal wealth stock, decisions. <laughs> and the but, stock market has been pretty pretty good. I mean, if you compare what you if you had saved and you watched what happened in the last year, you're you're up. Um overall so so I think there's a lot of money on the sidelines that's just ready to go. And I don't think that for most people, the financial thing is a problem. It's only a problem for hospitality people. Yeah. Some hospitality. For, for, for a lot of the leisure, for a good segment of the leisure travelers who generally for leisure travel, you need disposable income, right? I mean, that's kind of the, yeah, the, the base requirement. Yeah, that should be, you know, those with disposable income and, and the wealthier people are, the better they did through the pandemic, generally, generally speaking. Right. Um, but certainly not within the, the hospitality and you know, certain sectors really got really got hit. Um, I mean, yeah. And then you have the structural people who it. don't travel. Right? Say the survey, I mean, from beginning to now has never said that a reason preventing people from traveling has been economic. Right. Okay. It's never been in the top few, you know, choices. Right. Yeah, Sorry, the, people who can't, the people who can't afford it, they didn't travel before, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of thing. They were they're just kind of on the sidelines. Okay. Well, 
I'm so. going to I'm going to hang on to one vestige of what I said then and say corporate travel. Is it by choice, restriction, or need? Yeah. Choice. Okay. We've proven corporate travel. <clears throat> the need factor for it is not as high as right. it once was before. It has proven that we can exist in certain levels now of dialogue and travel. Now, I'm not talking community travel so much as I'm talking about travel for business or mm -hmm. travel. Um, but th there is a chewing of the bit about getting back to some normalities or ways we used to do things uh, about corporate travel. Mm -hmm. You know, but but again, going back to the, the Beats thing, even if he's 10 percent right, as Tim says, that's still a huge, wicked amount of money that is not going to come back into market. And a lot of businesses, a lot of big boxes downtown, big boxes were built on the premise of continued growth on that kind of travel spectrum. Um, yeah. You know, so there will be some retooling in our markets, I think. Will they be able to exist at the new levels or the, or the levels that would exist for uh, corporate travel when it comes back to the level that they feel comfortable? with? Because corporate travel doesn't spend unless there's a value proposition for it. Uh, they're not going to do it out of the benefit of the, of the people they're paying money to. It's like, oh, that hotel needs my business, so I'll travel just in case. No. <laughs> that and, and that that the algebra that figures that out, I think, is fundamentally changed for a lot of these CFOs, right? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of these CFOs are going to be looking at it, going, you know what? We have necessary travel and we have discretionary travel, and that slider is going to be moved radically toward the. This is all discretionary until you can prove that it's it's mandatory. Yeah, it's a must have, not a nice to have, and that's going. I think that's going to be the the big headwind, right? It isn't necessarily going to be the profitability of these companies or even the pandemic. I think a lot of these CFOs are going to look at it and go, wait a second, we can drop X percent straight to our bottom line, keep people on Zoom for the, and yes, if the salespeople need to go to close the thing, that's great. But do we need to send three on the team or does just one go and the other two tie in with Zoom? Or do we do it for a three, a four day trip and we're going to go entertain and do that? Or do we make it just you fly in, fly out and you're back? And a lot of these travelers, a lot of these road warriors kind of go, oh, I can spend more time with my family or <laughs> something. You know, maybe there, there are better things that I can do aside from just being, you know, leaving on the 6 a.m. flight on Monday and coming back on Thursday at the 10 p.m. flight. I'll, I'll share something. I can't share who I'm doing this with because it's a whole different thing, but I'm going to pull Tim Peter. I can't talk about who I'm dealing with, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> Is your CIA related also, Lauren? Again, really? it's, you know, wow. there's guns involved. It's really all the No. So we were, I was talking to a client uh, internationally and I uh, was joking about VR. Like, you know, I'm a geek and I was like, he's like, dude, you have a you have quest to him? I'm like, yeah. He says, you can join our meeting. And I'm like, what? And yeah. it's like, he says, yeah, yeah. And so we arranged it. And they used a VR meeting uh, platform that I already had, but it's free to download anyway, so it wasn't like a big deal. Uh, and there was a virtual C-level meeting. And they were very peachy to have me into the company. This is Lauren, you know, you're know, you doing no virtual. And it's in virtual reality that you're doing yeah. this. And I'm like, are you guys going to keep doing this? He's like, well, yeah, no, maybe. We, we're, we're trying. It's fun. It's, you know, the goggles are $299. There's no big deal for the C-level people, blah, blah, blah. And we're all sitting around the same room. And it's like, look, I can make a whiteboard in the middle of the room and all this. Oh, you know, it, half of the time was playing. Okay, just half the time was playing with the seal. But Call the cool is. part, what the cool part yeah. was, is that they were going to evolve that when people did begin to travel, to do because virtual reality is the whole three hundred and sixty experience as well. It's not just the virtual reality world. They're going to put into a three hundred and sixty camera because I already had the software where you have a three hundred and sixty camera in the middle of the table, mm -hmm. and you can look around if you're joining it from that perspective of the camera in the room. So if there's, when the people begin to travel again is what they're thinking is that they're going to get in the room together, but not everybody's going to be able to make it. It's hard to organize these guys into one place at one time. You know how sea level people are. They're all over the place um, and schedules and everything else, but it'll allow them to go over and, and say that we're, if we have a meeting and somebody can't make it, we're just going to plop the camera in Bob's seat <laughs> and Bob can be there in a three and he can look around at all of us in the room. And we're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, they, you know, they haven't done it yet. They're, right. That's what they're thinking they're the going to do. The technology's there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The technology is there. And especially as 5G rolls out more and more, phones are making it even easier to do that kind of stuff. But again, it's in, in the cost of technology for it and everything else. And that kind of goes back to our labor discussion some more. And that is there is technology implants that can happen that can help with the augmentation of lack of staff. There are things we can shortcut that would allow us not to need as many people to do the same things. I will 
go on the Dell side of the whole company, you will never, should never remove the human element. That should never be, you know, the, the the fun little things we used to look at in the news features that you sent us, Robert, you know, over a year ago of robot drag, uh, uh, dinosaurs checking in people in a Japanese hotel. Oh, yeah. Cute. That they pulled, those, long, oh, they pulled all those out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, because people do want to have recourse. I mean, that's probably one of the core element values of brand compared to independent hotels, that if you have a problem with your experience, you feel that there is more options of going to somebody other than the one guy that showed up at the desk and said, tough luck, that's what we do and leave it. And there he was a general manager of an independent hotel and there was nobody else you could talk to about your bad experience. That's where review platforms came into play because then you did have a different voice. You had a bigger voice that you could influence that the business by your poor, you know, reviewing their experience with them. And with brand, it meant that if you didn't have a good experience, you had other places to go to that said, hey, that hotel that has your name on it sucks. And this is what happened. And you feel that they're going to respond to what you said. That's a value of brand that you don't often get in other places. So I think in strange ways that having a human element, you want that recourse. Hey, the technology is not working. My key thing doesn't work or this doesn't work. You have a human that can come in and intercede and help you with whatever the problem or issue may be. So I yeah. think that having just a, a tool for example, like I used Trainual at one of the hotels and where you could make videos of here's how, you know, he, hey, you know, here's some of my best tips for how to clean the room. Here's how I know I'm making something really perfect. It's really important to make sure this, 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 and this, and you have it in writing and you have it in the video where you're actually emoting and, and explaining why things are important so that it's not just factual, but they get it and, the, and it will, they'll remember it. And if you have all those training tools, on video and you're onboarding new people, even if they're not experienced, they can, they can watch all the videos before they actually show up for their first day of training and they're kind of ahead of the game. So it makes that the combination of having the technical technology tool and a human person reinforcing that once they're on property or at the restaurant or whatever, you know, makes that so much easier and have a reference. This is what the banquet setup is supposed to look like if you're doing continental breakfast. This is the way the table is supposed to look uh, before board meeting starts, this, 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 and this. This is the way, you know, the bed is supposed to look at the end of the day. Um, having all those like, so that the new staff member can check on their phone and compare it, you know, while they're early on, it'll just make the 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 training so much easier. That's just one example of mm -hmm. how we can speed things up mm -hmm. um, to make it easier and 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 require less time for the trainer because the trainer has already one time made that video, one time written those things and expressed them fully, and everybody can listen to it in their own time. It's just like coaching for a thousand people on one session as opposed to one on one sessions with everyone. Yep. And repetitively going over the same thing again and again and only updating the parts you need. It's very true. Um, I think, you know, according to what Richard pointed out, the empty offices and so forth, I would like to make one thing. I think we're going to have different bumps in our perception of what happens in our business cycles. One of them will be the everyone wanting to go back to work, missing that camaraderie, missing that engagement, you know the office environment as it were. But I also believe we're gonna hit a time where when the weather turns bad on them or the car isn't working or the transient system isn't nice again or all the other things that we used to whine about when we had to go to work, when they begin to creep back into our, oh man, remember when I used to just sit at home and wear yoga pants or in some cases just wear pants and <laughs> and and, and do my work there and I didn't have to worry about the train schedule or the snow or the car starting or scraping out the driveway or whatever else went on. We're gonna have that cycle too. And I think that's when we're gonna really have the true point of companies allowing the tolerance of learning that people can do and function correctly from home. But they're gonna to have to create that criteria because one of the biggest things that they always hung over everybody said about working at home is how do I know you're working? Then you've hired the wrong oh. people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bingo. <laughs> That's what I have to say. If you don't trust your employees, then you've hired the wrong people, or maybe yeah. you just are, are they managing and don't need to be. 
Yeah. yeah. Are they producing the work that they're supposed to in the time frames that they're supposed to? Right. Think? But, but again, some organizations don't have that nailed down and they aren't necessarily the best run organization. And, and right. so some of this stuff will be self-correcting because those organizations should have should have problems. But yeah, I think the V the VR side is going to be very interesting. I was on a a, a, a Twitter spaces um Ooh. chat yeah yeah because Aren't i can't so get cool. on because i can't get on clubhouse but it was no I don't you don't know if you want guys to follow be. follow robert scoble he's been around he's a silicon valley guy he's been there for scoble sounds familiar yeah scobalizer i think he said blog scobalizer or whatever but um he had a very animated discussion with several other people about vr and there are a couple of people who are going oh hell no you know, I'm a B2B salesperson. I got to be out and do that. There's how I close these sales. And it's like, <clears throat> wait a second. Yeah, you do not. What are you doing? Is it the handshake? I mean, what is actually happening in that session that you can't do? In VR? Aside from I took the time, they finally resolved. I took the time to come visit you, right? So yeah. I have invested in this relationship by inconveniencing myself to the point where I have to physically be here. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so it's like, well, yeah, but what if you eliminate oh, commitment all that level waste? Yet. Commitment yeah, level. That, that level of commitment. Like I, I canceled all the appointments. I booked the flight. I paid a fortune. I'm here. Let's close. Okay, that's an outlier, probably. Well, <laughs> right? and there's so a what about difference. everything else? There's a big difference between getting somebody. Let's say I schedule a meeting with you at one o'clock in the afternoon, and we're on Zoom, we're on a phone call, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And now I've got you, but you're still in your office. And there are still other things going on around you, as opposed to when we go to a conference somewhere or I'm taking you out to dinner somewhere or whatever it might be. And now I've got you away from all of that. And you and right. I have a one on one. Right. It's never yeah. going to be a full replacement because I'll even add to that the list of body language. Okay. I've always prided myself in being in a gathering and being able to read who really knows what they're doing, not doing and don't care. <laughs> what are you talking about, Lauren? I don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, it just – and that will get missed. I, th I think sales pitches and sales dialogue will still be best effective personally because there is more dynamics, eye contact, yeah. innuendous, and beyond the verbal, verbal uh, body language, posture, uh, temperance of patients, whatever have you. I think VR is great for functional interaction. That that's not a requirement. Hey, I got to get something done. I need you to be a part of that process, if not the facilitator of certain things. And what I, my whole thing is communicating the tech, the, the concepts and the and information to you and understanding what you can be back. I don't need whether we're making eye contact and giving huggy squeezies. I don't need that. What I need is show me what you're talking about, explain to what it is that you're doing, and let's communicate back and forth to resolve whatever it is that's causing us to be together. That has a spectrum of VR and Zoom and everything else. But the question oh, yeah. is, what's the percentage, though? Right. That's, I think, the yeah. burning question that nobody knows. We know it's not 100 percent. Right. And we know that it's valuable. So it's it's not going to only be like, well, 90 percent of the travel is gone because you don't. Need it's somewhere in the middle. And I think it's going to be very interesting. Is that 70 or 30? It's probably in that mm -hmm. range somewhere. And again, who's making those decisions for corporate travel? It's going to be somebody who, who has a vested interest and a reward in, in lowering that number. Right. I, I want to address Richard's question yeah. in the comments here. He said, isn't it hard to have a company culture when working from home CEOs may care? And I can tell you as someone who's worked from home for goodness, like eight years now, maybe a little more well before COVID ever came into play. Yeah. And, and I've done it with companies that were work from home companies, uh, particularly because they had a global presence. And so, it, it didn't really matter where you were because you were going to be remote anyway. Uh, and I've also done it with companies that were not what I would call a remote friendly company. And, and there is definitely a disadvantage to working remote in that type of a company where if you were in the office in a cubicle and you had a question, you could just stand up and say, hey, Susie, how did you do this or whatever? Or that around the water cooler conversation, all those kinds of things that you do miss out on. But with, for companies that have embraced that, and that is their norm rather than the exception, they have learned ways to accommodate that. And, and sometimes even that means that you and your team just have a call, a Zoom call, where you're not talking about business. Just mm -hmm. talk about stuff. 
How was yeah. your weekend? What did you do? How about, you know, you, you had a, you camped out with Boy Scouts over the weekend or whatever, and just have that around the water cooler lunchroom conversation that you don't get anymore when you don't go into the office. And that helps build some of that camaraderie. But if, if you are just strictly a, this is the time of our meeting and you come in, I hope you have all your questions ready because if you don't, uh, when the meeting's done, you're out of luck until next week. That doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. That We're doesn't build cultural or loyalty, mm -hmm. I don't think. And, and um, you know, I think it, uh, Dan Conqueror, maybe, maybe it was Dan Conqueror, but maybe it wasn't. But you have to take the time to celebrate the good stuff so that people feel motivated to achieve and feel appreciated. And, and I think that that is a really... Uh, it's as important as getting paid to be recognized to, you know, so this, they, people can say, I see you and the great work you're doing. And I really like the way you handled such and such. And hey, everybody, somebody got a new client, whoopie do. You know, that that's important to the team. There, right? there, there's also, a, and this brings up a whole nother aspect of personnel and HR and management and culture and so forth that technology can augment to this. I've always been a fan of throwing away uh, traditional methodologies like annual reviews. They're, they're, they're outdated, they're inconsistent, and they often reflect the most recent activity and not the annual activity that they're supposed to reflect. You know, I may have been knowing a knockout job, but the last week I screwed up and then I guess what my review's up. Guess what gets in front of the mind when they start doing the ranking and rating of stuff is the screw up of this past week, even though I have, may have been the lifesaver of the company for 11 and three quarter months. And, yeah. and because of that, I believe that there's a way of doing this that adds to what we're talking about, that reviews isn't about the arbitration of one person's perspective or even two person's perspective, the supervisor, the manager, whatever. It's the perspective of the team that that person is engaged with that that involvement associated with what other team members think about you. And there's platforms like Seven Geese and stuff like this that allow for this slight gamification. We're all given tokens of awards that all of us can share. I want to give Melissa lots of tokens for amazing survey, you know, and through that process, there's an ongoing collaboration, an ongoing reward system, ongoing acknowledgement. I want to, I want to acknowledge Robert's effort this week for making a bang up newsletter, you know, and they get, put together so that when it comes time to give a financial reward, it's not once a year. It can happen any time of the year. And it can happen during certain achievements where cumulatively, you may have achieved something that said, you know what, I need to give you more money. I don't want to lose you. You're really good. And, and, and everybody in your team thinks you're really good. And everybody's acknowledging you and giving you all these things that we've they said are representations of their thankfulness to you. And so I'm gonna give you a raise right now. I don't wanna lose you, Adele, because you're amazing. And there you go. And, and, and it's not about whether you were here for a year. It's whether the fact that you're a valuable asset. And if I lose you because somebody else is going, wow, Adele's pretty good at that. We should just poach her from there and take her over to here. Why do I have to wait a year for you to come up with that? You know, you might right. just go and say, you know what? You're not really acknowledging me and I'm really rocking this. And this company over here sees that. I'm just going to go there. There's ways to do this that already exists. Sorry, Dean, you're going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, but the, but the reason they're built that way is because most of those programs are designed based on the assumption of I may have to weed out somebody and and get rid of the the, the bottom feeders. And they're more focused on making sure that they're covering their rear ends for that than they are about rewarding the employees. Yeah, there's always a dark yeah. side to it, but you know what? That's how we do marketing. Oh, I'm sorry, that guy had scrap. Let's dump that thing. It's not because it's my pet project one, which unfortunately may keep it alive because I'm the CEO and that's my pet project, and I'm keeping it alive even though it's a dead horse and we're dragging it to a well. You know, it, it, you, it, good marketing is done the same way. You throw out all these campaign variations. You do multivariate testing on all this stuff. You let's see what floats based on the KPIs that you establish as success metrics. And when it falls below it, you say, hey, it's not a bad idea. It's just not a good idea right now. Shelve it. Well, you just don't throw it away saying, oh, we tried that before and it didn't work. Yeah, you tried it at a different time or different project or different promotion. There's lots of other variables other than it just didn't work. But the idea is that you call the herd, as you said, repetitively to make sure that what is running is at the optimum level of what you say is the minimum standard of performance and in the criteria of what you were actually doing the project for. Hey, guess what? That's personnel. 
That's Ex- you've that's explained awesome. management right there, right? Because you have uh, you have objectives, right? For for a position, you have objectives, you have various processes that they're involved in, you have a, a minimum standard of performance, right? So there's a little bit of you know the ideal of, of what you um, want, but, yeah. And then you basically have the variance is here are the expectations, here's your actual performance. How do we give you the tools to get your performance up the expectations and let's go work through this iteratively. And if eventually if it like doesn't work, yeah, you, you, you'd stop that advertising campaign. It sounded like a great idea, but there's just nothing there to get. It's not, right. it's the wrong time or it's the wrong place. Or the the wrong, stuff. whatever it was. Right. Yeah. And you wind up doing that. So the whole thing of creating these cultures, it's, it's not easy. And it's, iter- I mean, Netflix is a great example. Netflix is famous for having their, well, they call it a no vacation policy. Other people call it unlimited vacation. Right. Because you can't you just take vacation when you want to do it. It took them, a, I don't know, like a decade to get that worked out. Right. It was an idea. And they had people abusing it and things doing that. And they they had to kind of figure out how. And I think it was the culture catching up where everybody goes, yeah, here's how we do it. And as long as you do your job and everybody kind of respected their co-workers and everything, then it it works. Right. So. <laughs> It kind of goes back to the when you were a kid and you used to play dodgeball. Well, maybe I not anymore because it probably is dangerous and you have to wear helmets or whatever it is that it can do. Uh, but back when you played softball and the kid that couldn't play very well never got picked until last because he had to get picked because he still had to fill the team. Mm-hmm. It's a sad world we live in, but people in business don't want to work with certain people because they're there and they're not good. And nobody oh. wants to work with them because they drag down the project and they in turn, and you it's like the old adage of bad apple. Bad apple can spoil the whole batch because eventually, okay, for me, I'm not really good at tennis. However, I love playing somebody better in tennis than me because I play my best worst game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll still lose, but I'll be miraculously amazing at it while I do it because I'm playing somebody better. I always want to work with somebody better than me. Which well, is why not I you all if the time. That person better is than me. To- it's like I want to work with everybody. If they're going to play with you, if they're just service A, service A, service A, I w- and you can't return it. I then buy them beer and it's okay. It's all right. Oh, no. Is there any- <laughs> <laughs> so the humiliation factor, Lauren's okay with. That's yeah. fine. So you know, it's like, hey, I, you know, dirty, dirty pool is like, hey, drink another beer. We'll play better. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But the idea of it is, is that nobody wants to have a laggard on the team. You want to be that team that says, "Damn, I want to be on that team." That team rocks. Everybody wants to be the best at it. You want that desire for people that if you get added to that team, you better show up. You cannot come to that meeting unprepared. I loved going into the meetings that I had when I worked at certain companies. The people that came to the meeting, you came with your A game. You knew it was a shark tank. You knew you better don't have an opinion without backup because you will be chewed up. Okay. You loved it. That's what you were there for. You wanted to be that person. You didn't want to walk in with a cup of coffee going, what are we talking about today? Because you were going to walk out with no butt on the back of your butt, uh, your back of your behind. Because you totally lost what you came in for. So Some I, people don't. No, no, no. And I agree. And I like teams like that. You like teams like that. You like the full contact. Let's let's go, right? Hey, we love it when Ed goes over and says, yeah, it's smart, but wrong. Okay, right, let's bring it right. on. You know? that's right. <laughs> Some, Some people don't, though. Some people don't like no, that that's kind very of true. And, and they just want to go and analyze. Like Melissa hates other people. She might not like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she hates all people. No, I don't know. I mean, and I'm, not, a hidden that was just a, that was I, I'm thinking you walk in thinking, oh, Melissa's not going to really push back oh, on you this get and shift. be like, ooh, that's you a bad day to pick that. You go, what the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I know. You, you know, people who work there, with me a... long enough know that. <laughs> I don't speak up often, but when I do, I've got something to say. <laughs> right. There, yeah, <laughs> but again, there are people who don't, they don't want that. And they look at that. Let's let those people in the room bat around. I'm going to go do the analysis, get it out, figure out the answer, submit, you know, go through whatever the product. Cause some people like, just like, give me a process. Yeah, but that's poor meeting strategy then. Because if you know, there's people well, on your team that come like Melissa saying, look, I'm going to come with data. I'm going to go yeah. and have. I'm going to have information about this. I'm going to present it in its purity as to what it represents and what I think it is. You understand that's the mechanics of the teamwork. That's the that's the fixer. Okay, yeah. I'm the one that's going to go over and say, let's throw this crap on the wall. Well, and, yeah, and but you got to make guy. sure the right people are in the right roles that they're kind right. of, you know that that those fits are. I mean, when I was at Saber, I inherited the weirdest. I mean, it was a highly dysfunctional team. 
right? We had some great people who were in completely, we had people in account managing jobs who really had problems with follow-up and closure. <laughs> not, not good traits, right? Um, but they're incredible trainers. They were in the training department. They were fantastic. They were really good at teaching the, you know, teaching the client how to do it. That had nothing to do with what their performance was getting measured on, really. I mean, when you really look at here, again, are the incentives aligned with the objectives? You're like, this guy is a square peg in the, what do we do to get him out of this role and something he's really fantastic? He's better at this than anybody else, but he's in the wrong place, right? So yeah, and you just had the weirdest, I mean, <coughs> my second day on the job, I had people come, and normally it's just like, hi, I'm here, I'm the new guy, I'm your boss. Hey, we're moving modules in two weeks, and I refuse to sit next to Jimmy. And if you try to make me sit next to Jimmy, I quit. And you're like, well, it's very nice to meet you, too. <laughs> so, I mean, and that was kind of the function where these people, like, hated each other and wouldn't work. And it was just, yeah, holy but, you know crap it, it, and it, it took it, a while to it took about six months to but, figure that stuff out you can have a room full of it, alphas right? you can have a room full of alphas but they all have their their pace they have all their stuff i would look at this if, if melissa and i were working on the same team i might throw a dialogue in i have an opinion about it i have a perspective on it i have an a, you know a, a concept purpose to this part but i also leave, leave it up to shoot it full of holes if it can't hold water it wasn't a good idea I think I would throw, if, if Robert, you disagreed with me, we'd go banter back and forth. Vidal, you and I disagreed with Ben. But if Melissa, who sat there, went over and said, this is what I think, it'd be like freaking E.F. Hutton, okay? Whoa, <laughs> stop. <laughs> because as you said, Melissa, if you're going, you don't talk much, but when you do, you bring the elephant gun, okay? Because it comes from a, this is my data source. This is the, you know, you come with the authentication statement. When you realize that dynamic of the team, that's what gets the, the result. I, I, I talk about it as a walking dialogue. And I look, I, I've said this story before. When I was GM, I'd be walking down the back hall and I had this beehive of people around me. And it was the daily grind of stuff. We have this issue, this broke, this. Other. And we're going around and around and maybe a doorman would walk up and is joined walking with us because he has something he has to deal with. But we're talking about something banquet related. And all of a sudden he'll pop and say, well, hey, uh, what about this? Nobody said, who the hell do you think you are? You're the doorman. We're talking about banquet stuff. Wait your turn or any of this other crap because we weren't that kind of team. We stopped, we listened, we thought about it in an equal playing field. Was that a good idea? And we shot at it and thought about it and like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Being well, turn around to the doorman. What, what do we say? What? You know, you've joined us. What do you need? That dynamic, that team is, you can make the impossible happen. Just takes a little bit longer. That's all it means. Because yeah. when you get that kind of trust and collaboration, you got a Melissa that comes in with an elephant gun on truth. You got a Nadell that will always tell you the human fact. You got Robert who will go over and I don't know where. No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, no I'm just picking on you, Robert. But the idea of it is, is that you have all these different players doing this. You solve anything. There's nothing you can't solve. You know, it's, 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 also it's a magic time. It's also important to you. We talked about bringing your A game. And as you're always bringing your A game, ne never let yourself play lower than that just because somebody else is in right. there that, that might not be right. more qualified. And a perfect example, there's an old friend of mine that I used to shoot pool with, and he was far better than I was. And we'd go shoot pool, and we'd be out, and he just beat me time after time after time. And I'd ask him, I was like, come on, take it easy on me. Give me a break. And he'd look at me and goes, no, I won't. And I'm like, why not? He goes, because you won't learn anything. Right. Right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's true and that's why i say with the culture part of it, it going back to what we originally brought this up with the culture part of it is you don't want deadwood on the team you don't want to be like oh melissa's on the team uh <laughs> <laughs> well that's a bad example stewart perhaps okay. yeah well yeah stewart definitely i would definitely be on that too it's like wait a minute why does stewart have to be here he's the kid he's the owner's son what you know, he's already got the cush job. Let's just go have him go play golf again or rugby or whatever the hell he does in Papua New Guinea. But, you know, that's just me. But, you know, I would much rather have, oh, dang, Melissa's on the team. That means I got to walk in knowing I got to know what I know and I got to be firm about my answer. I just can't say, I think it's blue today because Melissa will be the one going, really? Why do you feel it's blue? <laughs> I have all this information that says it's not blue. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so yes, in that sense, and I think also Richard brought up about my early conversation about technology. 
I don't know if there's a disparity between younger people willing to do just the remote stuff versus not wanting to do the remote stuff. I don't know. I don't think it's a gen, uh, a, a, a age category. I know, to be fair, younger people are wanting to be more interactive, I think, because of where they are in life. You want to meet people. You want to interact with people for lots of reasons we won't get crude about. But, you know, just... <laughs> But the idea of it is, is that you're wanting that interaction more. Plus, also, you, you have that youthful, I want to do more than what I've done yet mentality. And so I think probably inherently they're going to want to be more energetic about going and doing and being and seeing and traveling and all this other stuff. I think from an older perspective, if we're just to put age into it, you have more responsibilities that you have more reasons not to have to be so concerned about that. You already have relationships or you already have family. You already have uh, established routines to things that being home might be more convenient for you uh, compared to the youthfulness of not making a difference, I guess. Well, and those but, teen dynamics are tough. And I think you made a great Great point, because if it's a younger person and you're in you know, something like this, right? You just got some boxes on a screen. Very difficult for that doorman to become one of those boxes to get, you know, to get listened to in this kind of environment. Right. Yes. Because, all yeah. those, you know, they have to be bold enough to, oh, wait, do I raise my hand? Because I or maybe not, you know, and, and who's dominating the conversation or who's doing what or, you know, damn, Melissa has all those facts and Lauren seems pretty passionate about this. And yeah, whatever the case may be. Or drunk, either way, you know, it can go either way. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but again, that that can be very intimidating. And again, if, if the culture of how you handle things remotely is very different. I mean, you look at a group like WordPress or Automatic, they have like, I think it's like 1,400 employees or something like that, which isn't a huge organization, but they're in 70 countries. They have no physical offices, right? Mm -hmm. But apparently, the, from what I've heard, that company has a great culture where everybody's working together and and it's it's a true team that's performing well and doing all of these, you know, all of these great things. So it's possible. It's just the recipe for that's really different from the whole in-person, here's how we do that. And how these companies adapt and figure that stuff out is not, I, it's not going to just be a take the recipe book down and do it because everything's going to be very, very different for every organization. I also want to add special needs people involved in this conversation. We cannot ignore the fact that not everything works for everybody. Right. Uh, that there, there, there's two sides to this coin. One is, being able to do this for some people that may have physical limitations mm -hmm. is an amazing thing. The fact that I don't have to organize my travel to work with all the obstacles our society has created for people for ramps and door accesses and things like this, that, that, that stress diminishment has probably been a huge positive by being able to work like this and not have those concerns. By the same token, visually impaired people or people that may have limitations or audio people that have limitations as to their ability to interact, these can create huge obstacles for them that the office would provide a solution for being able to work together mm -hmm. based on what they're doing. So there, there is no, oh, this is gonna be perfectly fine to replace everything. Um, and, and you can't have them be in the office alone just because they're the only ones willing to be there or capable of being there. Uh, for whatever it is that they're doing. So there has to be a wonderful mix of this. And I think it goes back to something that was discussed earlier. There should be a flexibility of value that if it works better to do it this way at the times that it is this day or that day, like the, you said, the Netflix zero tra vacation thing, like, hey, life is life. Uh, today, something happened. I got a doctor's appointment. I got a yeah. family thing. I got a, you know what? The weather is crappy and I just don't want to fight the weather to get into the office thing. Whatever it is, as long as there's an alternative that can be satisfactory to the corporate requirement of, of business. This is awesome. That fact that those yeah. things now create as an option, uh, option, this is great. Can the doorman do that every day? No, because physically he's got to open the door unless they got to right. put a Oh, you know, maybe you can sit home with a button. Thank you. Welcome to come in. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. and, and also the interactions that he has with the front desk team and the concierge oh. and everything. And, and the manager just, uh, you're observing things and chiming in and giving suggestions, those things are helping that person grow. How is a person supposed to grow um, mm -hmm. if they're off in an office by themselves, um, not being observed? If for reservations, for example, mm -hmm. yes, I 
you could read through the transcript of the reservation. You could put on your headset and, and listen in. But there's nothing like just kind of being in the moment. That almost feels like you're snooping on them. Mm -hmm. But if you just happen to be in the room while you're hearing certain things, you get an idea of what's missing, what, what's going well, what's missing, what can be better. And you can softly coax that conversation so that that person has growth and can be a future general manager someday. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of well, nonverbal communication that goes on in a hotel. And for anybody who's had the ple ple pleasure to work in a hotel, you can tell by a look from your doorman who the guest that's having the issue is. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't require a word. That didn't require nothing other than the, oh, that person. Yeah. And you know by walking out to the lobby, that's where you're walking to because that's the person you need to talk to because that's the person you got called going, yeah, listen, there's such and such going on. The, the dynamic of that or and going back to my beehive of conversation, when we're talking about an issue, everyone has a unique perspective from the role that they're playing within the hotel. As with any office, as with any, I mean, you working in an office environment, you can have somebody walk by your office or your cube or something, and they can give you the look that tells you, oh, they're in the office, are they? <laughs> you know, the person you guys talk about when you're by the water cooler, they're here, or the client that everybody talks about, they're in the, yeah. in the meeting room. You know that by the way that somebody walks by your office going, hey, Lauren. Oh, they're here. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't exist in this world. That exists in the personal world of I'm working with you in a space and we go together and we spend time together. But that that unspoken dialogue, that 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 communication capability is magic when it's worked collectively. Mm -hmm. Where it's not about politics or preferences or cliques or niches or you know, uh, whatever have you, but when it's worked into the benefit of everyone, when you're with your team in a meeting with a, a client or and uh, somebody or whatever, and your team can look at each other and know what, you, I'm gonna pause now because Adele's ready to talk. Cause I know by the way that Adele just looked, you know what, Adele can add a solution to what the client just brought up. And I don't have to say, oh Adele, did you want to say something? It's like, no, I can tell by the way Adele's looking, it's like, give it to me, you know, that kind of thing. That's magic, that's cool stuff. When you're with a team like that you do that with, that that I, I can tell you the three teams in my life that I had that benefit with. I mean, literally faces and names, because mm -hmm. when you have that kind of collaboration with people that you work with, every day is a good day. No days bad. You have bad things happen, but it's never a bad day. Yeah. So, anyway, that's me being happy. <laughs> Melissa, sorry, there was a few more things. I'm sure there's a lot more things, but is there is there some other things that you want to make sure we didn't miss now that you had that hot off the press? Oh goodness, uh, let's see. I'm just scrolling through some interesting thing. We've already talked about when people are going to travel. Uh, that hasn't changed. Oh, he asked again about the hotel cleaning protocols increasing or not increasing your confidence in staying mm -hmm. in a property. Same things as a whole that we've seen before. The quote unquote deep cleaning between guests is very highly popular as is the TV remote sanitized and placed in a sealed bag. However, for the people who are not getting a vaccine, they just don't give a crap about anything. Everything is all fine. <laughs> you know, it's just gonna, the, it's going to strengthen your immune system by getting these things. There you go. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. Okay. I don't understand from a tech. I know high tech is going to come up in September and I am actually looking forward to the fact that I can hopefully plan logistically to actually go in Dallas, go to high tech. Cause I think it's going to be, if everything stays safe and nothing really goes far left again, having HSMA's combination of their marketing conference, the rock conference, a high tech and everything else. I think this is going to be a huge mega love fest. I don't think anybody's going to go to any of the sessions. I think it's all going to be group hugs and kumbaya. Yeah, I don't get any work done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but why has it? Okay, so I can be at home, and we have one remote for the Roku. Guess who gets that? My wife. Okay, so for that in mind, um, I want to change the channel on TV when my wife's not there and the remote's on the air and I'm too lazy to get up. I can use my phone to change the freaking channel on the TV. Why can't somebody figure out how when oh. we go to the hotels, you can just have that function and get rid of the dang remote worry. Like, you know what? I don't yeah. want to touch the remote. Let me just log in and use my own damn phone to cover the control of the TV. You know what I'm saying? Having Sorry. done a done a project uh, last, last fall for Focusrite on this topic for <laughs> in-room automation, guest entertainment, and internet, there are 
huge, huge factors involved <laughs> because all the technology, I mean, you've got, you're dealing in that situation. You've got to deal with the, the Apple ecosystem, right? to make sure. sure the app gets on the gets on the phone and everything like that. Um, you've got to make sure that all of those owners have the proper technology installed, which may be a, a set top box. It could be an internet related thing. It could be all sorts of sure. items related to that, which cost money. They need the right kinds of te televisions that interact with that box because just sure. a regular coax cable coming out of the back of the, you know, back of the sure. set top box, ain't going to do it sure. sort of thing. Oh. Right. You need all those things. And all of a sudden they go, Oh, that's more expensive to do this. And to get consistent compliance across all the brands Dude, and all, all you 30 told me brands. About is if I have a hotel that has this functionality and I solve an issue that Melissa pointed out as a concern based on people's sentiment of this thing, that I just stole money game. from your company hotel that didn't have it. That to right. me is what that said. Yeah, no. And <laughs> that's, mean, and that's what you do. And, and, some groups are able to do that, but like a citizen M or somebody who started with like tech first type thing yeah. can well, do that, that, right? Because they were able to get a lot of these, a lot of these COVID protocols and things like that. They kind of went, yeah, we've got our service bus. We got the data. We can do, what can we do? We fix it on the interface and we're done, right? That's how it should work. The other guys don't have an enterprise service bus to go bolt stuff onto. Okay. Right? So Marriott, just as, just let's take one out of the hat. Marriott has their app. And Marriott allows you to do lots of things with their app. And also Marriott has a standardization of their hardware and their system. And our Marriott already even allows you to log into your Netflix that supposedly gets purged at the end of it when you're no longer using the password accesses. So you already have this functionality of dialogue that the hardware is already there with a platform that's already capable, with an app that's already in, uh, downloaded on yeah. multiple platforms. Why can't they just say, let's add this small little thing and boy, we after, can sell compared to anybody else that doesn't have it. After seven years... Um, what percentage of Marriott hotels abide by the corporate standard for casting? Oh, it was established like six teens, or seven years. Probably right? in the teen, the teen percentages, I imagine. They're a little high, but yeah, it's maybe above 10. It's like 12% or something like that. So they win, the, everybody else loses. So, Guess who's going to start buying new but technology? That's not, you know, that was something, it was recommended. <laughs> And here's what we're going to do. And this works. And guess like we figured this stuff out, but it's not deployed by the owners, the right? Because you have to. Money making. Go ahead, the carrot the isn't enough. They need the stick. And that, that's that's a problem, right? So yeah. Just re ahead, remove the start. device from the equation because you can have voice activated services. My little dot over here, whose name shall not be mentioned because she'll turn on, uh, <laughs> will, con will control my Roku. You can control your Roku with that. And you don't have to yeah. use that necessarily, but just have a voice activated thing that says uh, TV, but, TV on, but now you're on. dealing now you're dealing with Amazon interacting. Well, you don't have to deal with, with that. You can use other technology. Oh, but what what if somebody what you want to do ultimately? I mean, the end game is if someone's an Android user and Google Assistant does freaking amazing things, right? You should be able to just tell your Google Assistant, or if you've got Siri on your Apple device, Siri should be able to do the same stuff. Right. There's or if you're Amazon, right? And you're carrying your little fire tablet and you've got, you know, Alexa, that should be able to do it too. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter. But building that technology for all of those sets to come into the same, you know, same funnel and to have all that same functionality is no. very comp it's the same thing as you like put Lauren was saying with room. Netflix. What? You put your own in the room. So the so you don't worry about the consumer bringing theirs along. You no. have your own hardware that's in the room that's built into the entertainment. That's going to fail. The, 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 the end user interface, it's too expensive. The technology has to be updated and the owners can't, they can't keep up. You get, that's why all the little, um, oh, you will still, I mean, if people were traveling, they'd still see the little clock radio with the Apple, um, thing to plug your phone you're like hey that's not a fire never fits. <laughs> yeah and it's it's junk now right and yeah. you've got it you now have to replace the whole device so yeah all the ones who put in here are the tablets and things like that again you're touching something in the room which is why not just touch still, the remote still, instead of the tablet right i'm so. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on hilton's side of doing the self the phone that does everything oh yeah but again i i push back on the the, the logistics too because even now i've built an app they automatically goes to iOS and Android, and I'm not saying I mean, and to yeah to both, and I'm not saying that that simplicity is something that to scale a Marriott or somebody could perform because obviously I'm dealing with different metrics, 
But the idea that that's a, a, a fence or a problem, it doesn't exist. Most everything app wise, if, if to be put to work, it goes what, on both platforms. What SDK are you using? How many how many versions of Android are you supposed to just the newest version? It's still, all of them are baseline to- now. All of them are baseline six and up and stuff. It's the same thing why you can't yeah. use stuff on Internet Explorer anymore. It's because it's been turned off. It's I'm sorry, if you're that old, it doesn't work. And yes, you can right. still use the remote, which goes back to that process. But yeah. But if you built it on that version and if you're Apple, all of a sudden it has to get up. See it's what just, you did, these Melissa? Guys, uh, these see? guys have really – and I completely agree with you. This should be – you should be able to just go to your – use it and say, watch Handmaid's Tale on Hulu, right? Because that's going to be a big thing in a couple weeks, Open right? Guide. And it should just go there because you have a relationship with Hulu, right? On your phone, it's it's right there. You should just be able to, to do it, right? I, but – Hulu, the problem with Hulu and these things, the hotels or Disney Plus is a better example. They can't even talk. They can't even get a call return from the Disney Plus people, right? They won't talk to the hotels. They're like, you should be sitting here. We have X tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of rooms every night, which should you should be looking at as like little individual movie theaters. And we could introduce a service to people with a deal and you could onboard more and they're huge opportunities. Nah, nothing. So again, these guys, it, it's the internet bandwidth, it's the mesh networks, it's all of this stuff. And when you talk to these guys about, well, what are you doing for Wi-Fi 6? What are you doing for um, you know, 5G? They're like, nah, nothing. And you go, wow, Wi-Fi 6 could just fix all this stuff. You well, know, I but again- a strange way to a benefit, yeah. I mean, independent hotels would be more of a challenge, but I think, Melissa, go and bring up what you're saying. It's an interesting thought. You guys have a wonderful app. It's already built and worked and integrated. This is an enhanced conversation of saying, well, what phone, what what TVs do you have? Because if you, rather than saying you should do this or you have to change all this out, there's a lot, a lot. Because we, okay, let's go back in some age. There used to be when you went to high tech, rows of TV service providers, all proprietary. Mm-hmm. Everybody had to have their own equipment boxes, TVs, everything else. Good God, it was like a main portion of high tech. That's gone down to a trickle because you can just buy off the shelf smart TVs, plug the dang thing in. As long as you got, you know, AT and T, Direct TV, something or other, you feed all the TVs, and everybody can choose a thousand one channels anyway. And it's cheaper and easier and less, you know, whatever have you. The, con- I'm, the I'm, controls I'm being- over that and the contracting isn't that simple. Okay, I understand. Guys. There's That's logistics. A big- big obstacle you can do that and you, you're like good you have 200 tvs in the hotel everyone you're going to play netflix 15 bucks a month to go do that and you go oh and that doesn't work right so yeah you've got to be careful with all the and then you multiply it by all of those different services and all the different functionalities is, yeah. yeah but what i'm saying is is that from a client of fuel travel let's say if they found out that they had TVs that were much like they are now, smart TVs, the Roku TVs and whatever have you in the world, and you have this, how cool would it be to be able to functionally say, okay, great, you can control the TV with your own remote by just looking at the code that pops up on the TV and putting that into your Roku. And for the time you're there, that's when it works. And you shouldn't even have to do that. I mean, if you use Hotspot 2.0, you should just walk in from your device and you should transition Can't from your 4G network. because the room network. next door can have the same problem. You have to hex key into what you're getting to no. that TV. So you no, 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 no. Regi- no, it's because the credentials through the registration for the property management system then give you... Yeah, see, now you're making it bigger. Of- no, I'm just making it dirt simple. It's just no. a function of the app addition to the TVs that are capable. You're over it's not really making the wheel. <laughs> You're grossly See, Melissa, you're still making this problem for us. <laughs> no, no, no. I, this it's is not a, my fault. I just am agreeing with your intelligent introspective of a problem that's trying to get solved while Robert, ignorant as he is oh, to no. the concept of, of solutions, is looking at nothing for the <laughs> The end state should be there. The hotel industry has not, again, the incentives for the owners and the brands to execute that objective are in conflict. It doesn't, it hasn't gone. And actually let's even get the TV out of it. Just simple onboarding to the Wi-Fi would be great. You just walk in instead of having to go put in SSIDs and things like that. How do you, if you're a member of the rewards program, 
And then Starwood. Hey, Mira already Mira has that, dude. Mira already has yeah, it. They they the, yeah, they took the automatically. Starwood process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. But they were also using the, the MAC address of the phone, which is now getting randomized by everybody. And that doesn't work anymore. Right. I didn't so say now, it's going to keep working. I said it was working. <laughs> it was. And it broke. <laughs> So yeah, because another solutions in play, and it was sure, it was very elegant. Very they go, that's Lawrence, smart and that's the else Mac like ID that. on Lawrence's phone. So he goes to the the courtyard. He goes to the Ritz Carlton. Everything is like wow. He doesn't have to log in. It's there because they go hi, welcome back. Robert, but all now I you can't do that you, from a security perspective. You are Sorry. the poo poo player for this conversation. I, you are <clears> nothing but obstacles. No, 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 I no. am prescribing to Melissa's idea idealistically that this is something that would be an amazing thing. That would solve a the obvious apparent dilemma from the data that's being there, used. There's a solution, and there are two starting points to the solution. One is a unique hotel identifier, right? Oh. That you can establish that entity of the hotel. The somebody unique. would come up with that. But if yeah. only somebody would come up with that. Jeez. You, you do that. So all of a sudden, you have a trusted authority that you can exchange credentials with. And then on the other side is self-sovereign identity through like the distributed um, identity foundation and the W3C who sets all the internet standards who go and say, yes, here are all the different and actually, I, I was on a call earlier this morning, which was very interesting because we're, we're working with Diff and how to get this thing done. And actually, interestingly, the hotel industry or the hospitality and travel industry may be leading the rest of the world on this. This is very, very yeah, cool stuff. But you have all we were talking about our use case is going to be changing your address, right? Because you're part of seven reward programs here and these programs. are. What happens when your address changes? Right? How do you give that to it? And what's going to happen is you have a little token that goes out and says, yes, that's a validated address. Or yes, I work for IBM or Amazon or, or whoever. Do they need to know your pay stub and see how much you get paid or what you're, no, you just need that validation, right? And then you can decide to share having self-sovereign identity. You know what? Marriott's got everything. They, they, you know, they can, Marriott can know that I travel 50 times a year, instead of just the six to Marriott's, I travel 50 times a year and I'm members of all these, programs. I'm willing to share that with Marriott, but Hilton, maybe not for whatever reason. So you should be able to pick and choose and pass that stuff. And those technologies exist. But again, yeah. it's going to start at one end on the supply, one end on the, the, the Sony fan, one end on the consumer. That's and guess what? You're going to connect the dots between the two. So for the independent hotel, you don't need the large central Marriott app or whatever to go make that happen. Okay, or we're Expedia the game or password. The word for today is self-sovereign. Self-sovereign identity, SSI. Big thing. Yeah. Okay. We can talk right, about it. That. If, you, if you care to dig deeper into identity hubs, nobody knows how those work yet. But that, but they're essential to this process. So. I have definitely wound up, Robert. I'm just, I apologize now. <laughs> oh no, no, there are there are good, there are very smart people working. Uh, like kind of the people working at Nick Price, Nick Price, former CIO of Citizen M, who came up with the whole enterprise service bus, things like that. Um, right. Doug Rice, the former, you know head of HTNG, um, Gene Quinn, who a lot of people know from like co-founding Focusrite with Philip Wolf. But before that, Gene used to be the guy at Viacom and, and MTV who set up all their digital stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be before that, I think he was with AOL, did a Tribune, um, newspapers, always that online digital. Now you're just He's name a, dropping, Robert. No, no, no. There are dropping. some there are some very, very smart people involved in this okay. stuff. So very that, cool stuff. With that, I'm going to go. So, over so it will happen, Lauren. It will. I've named the. I'm glad you're optimistic about but this. I'm working you know. on the solution. I'm working really hard on the solution, and I'm not getting <laughs> paid for it either. It's all pro bono. Uh, <laughs> don't be bitter. Don't drive angry. All right. Uh, with that in mind, Melissa, was there any closing item you want to make sure we hit? Two, and two really two, quick okay. stats. Super okay. quick that we'll not have any discussion about. Okay. I don't think. Oh. <laughs> is talking about uh, flights. This is the first time we've seen people ready to fly within the next 30 days of higher than 10%. We're up to 21% of people said they would willing to fly within the next 30 days. 
So nice. that was exciting to see. And then lastly is, um, uh, hang on, wait for it. It's gonna be brilliant. Okay, uh, what people wanna hear from hotels, we're back to packages and specials taking over the top spot. We had more than 50% of votes this time. And that's the first time it's been in the top result since a year ago. Everything has been about safety, safety, safety up until now. And now we're back to people wanting to hear about packages and mm. specials, which a uh, right. good or bad, not sure, but it's definitely a shift. Interesting. Yeah. And, and if you correlate that with the time that you're thinking people are wanting to travel, I might have to alter my travel ad strategy because we have not been promoting, for those that they know the segmentation, packages. We've right. been promoting hotel stay. Right. Yeah. I'm curious. I, I haven't been on a plane now for over a year. And I know for a long time the flights were doing that staggered seating thing, leave the middle seat open, those sort of things. Are they still doing that? Does nope. It nope. But I would not be comfortable flying with that guy right next to me. I'd have issues with that. Isn't doesn't Delta have that still until June? Mm, maybe I, they've Delta, all said Delta it's gone away. A big big promotion about they're still keeping the center aisle empty. They they might Southwest I think gave up on it. Um, American definitely. Oh, everybody else has. Yes, and, everybody yeah. else has. American was one Ooh. of the first to jump off of that. Yeah, but. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think Delta is still offering that that is the case and or rebook if it if for any reason because they are allowing the, ho the, the 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 plane to fill, but they're not selling. But if they have to, then they will let people rebook if they don't want to. Oh, no, no. They're May one. May one. They'll stop May one. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right, so May. It's almost over next month. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're all jumping all over the CDC. I mean, even just this week, jumping all over the CDC, saying oh, it's safe line. to be in the middle seat. We're go, we're you know, full speed ahead, yeah. folks. Cruise yeah. lines are making ultimatums, which is like, okay, you're going to shoot your cut your leg off just because. Oh yeah, we'll just to... leave Florida. Yeah, completely. Yeah, that's going to work really well. Yeah, yeah, um, you can send send all the ships to the Mediterranean for all the Europeans to get on them. Yeah, that's yeah, going to happen. That, that'd that, be positive. Uh, um, well, you know, first off, Melissa, um, way cooler you're here than Stuart. It's so mm -hmm. nice that you're here. We really don't miss Stuart. Not that we really miss them anyway, but especially now we don't miss them anymore. Well, we never uh, liked them and we don't miss them. That's yeah, right. We never liked them anyway. And <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, it is. Thank you. Oh, for he's making not, he's, I don't think he's, today. he's not. I don't think he's, he's not. Actually. You know what? I've what we poked the tiger out. how many times today? You know, yeah, Papua New Guinea, that. Tonga. We've we've done everything we can, to, and the dude's just totally dead <laughs> silent. I mean, he's winning the argument there. Um, yeah. Melissa, please, for those who don't know that the link is already in the chat, but where can they find the latest results when you put? Uh, they're already I'm they're already on the site. So yes, they're okay. already up. You can go to fueltravel.com/blog, and it is there, along with the link to our two time award winning podcast. Yes. And if people want to reach out to you, Melissa, where is it they can find you if they should have any questions you about the universe and cosmic reality? Me on LinkedIn at Melissa Cavanaugh, and that is K A V A N A G H. No you. No, no you. you. I learned that after respelling your name multiple times. I'm, I should, I should, probably should have my email in like five different spellings. It's fine. Just misspells, just like you do with domains, just misspells. Just that way they redirect to the right thing, you know, catch all. And of course, um, I'm on Clubhouse too, if anybody wants to find me there. Ah, that's true. Um, so with that in mind, Miss Adele, for people to know more about you and your podcast and everything else, where is it they can find you? AdeleGutman.com is my website, and you can find out about all the services that I offer, helping hoteliers become number one on TripAdvisor or any review site. Uh, we can do better. Wherever it is that you are in terms of your guest satisfaction scores, there's always better that we can do, and and uh, I'd love to help. And I adore Stuart Butler, by the way. And <laughs> I wish you <laughs> Stuart Butler on the show. You can go listen in today to my podcast that uh, I just got live uh, last night or this morning. Uh, my interview with Stuart Butler talking about uh, you know the convergence of of operations and and marketing, and. Uh, so, yeah, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Amazon, uh, Audible, my favorite uh, app, and um, any place that you listen to uh, podcasts. And, and I'll post it, by the way, on, uh, on YouTube as well. 
So Yay. you'll be able to see it on my website as well very shortly. <laughs> and and obviously Adele is excellent at a role of customer engagement and reviews and reputation management, but a very poor judge of character. <laughs> I don't know how that, how does that work together? Hey, I don't know. hey. Oh, you, know. you know, everybody has a blind spot. Everybody I guess so. Spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. We found, we you found know. kind of the Achilles heel of poor Adele. Yeah, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, Stuart piped in. Don't worry, I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you're not talking, so we can talk about you. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Dean, sir, for people to know more about you and your podcasts that are coming up today. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you can visit basecampmeta.com where we have some educational resources talking all about meta search. In fact, we have a, a class series that you can subscribe to on there uh, or metasearchmarketing.com, uh, which is focused more on, hey, let's run the meta search for you. So if you need somebody to run your meta search campaign rather than hiring a person to do that, who, by the way, probably has to take the training that I mentioned earlier, uh, we can run it for you. <laughs> Uh, likewise, we've got our Google for Small Hotels program that we've rolled out. So if you're a small property that uh, none of those big vendors out there want to talk to, guess what? We can get you live on Google Meta. Uh, and there's lots of ways of doing that. Uh, as you mentioned, we have resurrected the podcast. Uh, so we've got two of those in the hopper. I've actually got content for three more ready to go. So uh, Inspiration yes. has struck the I lightning know. It's has like hit the ground. The, the, the <laughs> lights have shined down upon me. <laughs> I got Any tweets me at Dean and at <laughs> Perfect. Mr. Cole, not knowing exactly all the things you do, but knowing you're doing it with very powerful and influential people by the name dropping you have, where is it that they can find you and actually find your award winning podcast? My no, award winning podcast? podcast? Yeah. Oh, wow. I, yeah, that's, I would like to know where I can I find see, that. I want to well. see what you go over and do with that. I want to see what you do with that. It's like, well, yes, it's award winning. Uh, yeah. Secretly. <laughs> It's in the secret so, circles of CIA. Yeah. You're the star on the wall. Yeah, no, that's Tim. When you talk about CIA, we got like the CIA true. and the KGB on the same call here. Today. And, <laughs> oh, and I've just started the Americans. I'm into season two. Very, very uh, highly recommended. So, mm -hmm. aside from from watching the Americans, um, you can find me at RockCheetah.com, um, where I do a lot of marketing strategy and travel technology planning, and try to keep those two groups from killing each other. I think is my main main. Um, goal in life. And uh, yeah, you can also find my work at Focusrite. And if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash rock cheetah, all lowercase. And there are a whole bunch of stories that you can look at this week. Now, there were a couple, Adele did point out, she, she dropped a note that there's one is, you know, what is hospitality and why isn't it working from the New York Times, which I highly, highly recommend. It's about restaurants, but it transfers pretty pretty aggressively. And the reason, because I said there was going to be a quiz, which you guys obviously- yeah, blew just oh, a little bit at 6.30 in the morning. I was yeah, I know. Yeah, I was but, like, yeah, <laughs> But the quiz was, why did I include that? It was because Marriott now is going full automat in terms of vending machines and things like that in their, uh, in their hotels, or at least they're prototyping it. It's like complete non-human, here's a wall of of stuff that you can go push the buttons and get, which yeah, yeah. automat was was pretty popular in nineteen fifties, I think. I was about to say, I mean, you know, and if you go if you go to the Netherlands, there, there's there's uh, Fabos and and places where they yeah. have hot food in little windows, and you put the yeah. coins in, or or you put the card in, and you pop out the food, and it's amazing what's it's, what's old. It's new amazing, again. yeah. And Japan has some cool things like that too. Yes. I would oh, I would not Japan, argue that that Japan. is I wouldn't argue that that's hospitality, however. No, so. I I do think if you're removing room service, which some hotels have talked about or do, and if you're removing the mini bars, you should have a place, especially if you're a big hotel, but even a small hotel, you know, something that somebody can get to eat. Uh, you know, uh, if you're starving, if you just don't have the time to go out, if you have kids that are hungry at whatever hour it is, if you arrived on a flight from another time zone and, you know, the restaurant isn't open, whatever, it's good to have something that you can just get. And that place may not make enough money to be staffed all the time. So, you know, I, I have a little compassion for that. I don't know whether, I don't think it should replace a restaurant. Right. Well, and I think the interesting point on that is, another story that was in the newsletter 
was Marriott's now struck a deal with Uber and Uber Eats and things like that. So that's how you can get your food through the third party. And, and you go, wait a second. Yeah, Marriott, you've got a hundred hotels in New York city, ghost kitchens. I mean, Travis Kalanick, who started, you know, who started Uber, right. Who got out cause he's, you know, an interesting guy to work for apparently um, is has his ghost kitchen concept is, I think he's just bought something like a hundred some warehouses around in all these cities to start gener you know, creating these ghost kitchens. Like you got a lot of kitchen space and things like that. You know, Hotels could make this happen and serve not only their own properties and probably figure out ways to do it very efficiently and quickly and less expensively than paying a third party who requires profit margins and things like that externally, you know, all these externalities. I think you could, you could do that. But again, a lot of these organizations, they don't see a direct ROI in doing it. So why are they going to do it? They aren't. Right. Yep. So well, it just goes by the wayside. Anyway, it is. It is and that, you know what? Honestly, I, I think we'll probably bring that up in Clubhouse. Oh, sorry, Robert. Uh, next week. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I'm no. Shunned. To, to Technologically be, to be, shunned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait. Hey, the so hotels. Right wait. The hotels will do the single sign in from any device. Maybe once Clubhouse will let Android users. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Because no. that's but, such a hugely insurmountable technical obstacle. Right? What? You Hell would yeah. think, right? So, Actually, yeah. I think, I think, I, I honestly think there's a handful of people in Clubhouse who go, oh, wow, didn't expect that. And we're like, in their head, like, what do we do now? It's blown up to be as big as it is. But, yeah. All, all said and done, yes. And I think it's actually a very tangible conversation that we should bring into next week's live show here, Friday, is ghost kitchens and the emergence of, because room service was done back in the time when it was, don't tell the hotel guests what's around us. We want to do internal capture. We want them to be in our restaurants. We want this to be a walk in the door and not, and not until you leave us, you know, uh, you, we take care of everything. And room service was a part of that component. And a lot of older buildings and, and larger established places and banquet facilities and so forth have the capabilities to adapt to the new world of what's going on, as we see with Marriott joining up with Uber and everything else. So all said and done with that. That's for next week. But to remind everyone, we also have the Clubhouse conversations at noon. Uh, if you do have the iOS app for Clubhouse, we do it under the Hospitality uh, Marketing Club. We do a room at noon and also at 8 a.m., uh, Mr. Stuart Butler, who decided not to grace us with his presence today and give us instead the much more talented Melissa. Um, he and Edward St. Ange, also who is not with us today, do, do a 8 a.m. Uh, room, pretty much to the same context of open discussion, open forum. Has Stuart sobered up enough by 8 a.m. No, 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 no. On Stuart, that Stuart, Stuart, well, fun. Stuart's still in a drunken stupor, which I think is oh, okay. why he's not on. Okay. Is that just he hasn't put on his yoga pants yet, which. I'm actually thankful he didn't join the show because probably. Well, maybe with that, stood up. that indecipherable foreign accent, maybe the slurring helps and it maybe sounds a little bit more probably, American I think English. Of, I think what he calls the Carolina component, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are recording our podcast in person today for the first time in a year. Oh, wow. wow. So, so he'll be bringing in his homemade homemade brew, hopefully. <laughs> Oh, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't say one other thing, which I think is very important for the industry to, to know, which I, I did highlight in the, in the newsletter a year ago, RevPAR for the, for the hotel industry across the U S everywhere was $15 and 22 cents. Yeah. This wow. right now it's, it's $95 and 22 cents. <laughs> that's a pretty, that $80 difference is, yeah, that's the difference yeah. from last year to now is pretty, pretty, pretty eye opening. Yeah. So with that, we also want to make sure that everyone can play this back. We do replay this at 1130 a.m. Sydney time, 1130 a.m. London time on Wednesday for those who are in different time zones, even though we do get lots of people that watch us in those times and live anyway. We do have our clubhouse at noon and we also have the hospitality marketing podcast. We do have the sales podcast. We do have the um, let's see, we're using marketing, sales. I think I got all of them. Yep. Um, revenue? Oh, revenue management, revenue management, Lily's. Revenue. Sorry, thank you. Forgot about Lily's. Lily's mm -hmm. revenue management, which Lily, I think, is going to come back with us next week. I think she's been 
one of 25 jobs or companies she started since then. So we'll see whether Lola pops back with new, new stories to tell. Wait, have you, have you done your, your crocheting and um, I think jeweled applique ones? Are those out yet? That's a whole different one. And we won't talk about Stuart's Star Wars Club room, which he has yet to actually convene, which uh, bothers me because he made me join it because I was I, really geeking out I, with I might it. join that one. Would I, you please? Because we're, <laughs> we're, you know, whenever Stuart sobers up enough to run a room, We'll uh we'll we'll have a Star Wars room to talk about deep Star Wars stuff. But anyway, with that, thank you everyone for uh, oh hospitaldigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. You get to play back all these shows. So even this little part that you probably want to play back. But anyway, talk to everyone next week, Clubhouse and or on the live show at eleven thirty a.m. Melissa, thank you for joining. Adele, thank you as always. Robert, hey, mm-hmm. thanks for showing up. No, I just <laughs> And uh, I, prob- uh, so I, say every week, time I probably today. I won't be here next week. Oh <laughs> uh, man, actually, it's kind of fun to have you here. So it's kind of and Dean, yeah. thank you as always. Stuart, we ran out of time for you to join us. Sorry, bud. We'll have maybe catch you next time. Okay, maybe you can join <laughs> in next time. <laughs> be the Matt, running Matt Damon joke. Yeah, yeah running Matt Damon joke. <laughs> all right, bud. Everybody, thank you so much. Hey, I'll talk to you all next week. Bye. <laughs>